Okay, everyone, let's uh, get started. First of all, let's uh, have uh, inter introductions of, uh, we'll see, Seth, why don't you give us the role here, first of all. And we'll Dick Whitnell. Here. Pam Curtis. Ron Saxon. Here. Hannah Vandering. Here. Duncan Weiss. Here. Okay, let's go around the uh, audience and introduce yourselves, if you would, please. Uh, yes. Uh, Sarah Hope, Chief of Staff at the Doug Wells, Children's Institute. John Wyckoff, Working Community College Association. Uh, Elizabeth Brand, Working Community College Association. Ben Kevin, Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Jim Randers, Inside Council on Operating AC. Dick Louie with AC Teams. Mark Lewis, Office of the Chief Education Officer. Hilda Grisselli, OEIB office. Kelly Kennedy, OEIB intern. Matthew Shabble, Development Council. Ted Wolf, Senate Bill 540 Task Force. Pat Burke, the Graduate School of Academy, Portland State. John Sakarabu, Target Business Council. Dave Porter, International Education Advocate. David Williams, Portland Public Schools. Morgan Allen, Oregon School of Association. Seth Allen, Oregon Education Investment Board staff. Megan Irwin, Acting Early Learning System Director. Uh, Lindsay Campus, uh, OEIB. Nancy Golden, OEIB, Chief Education Officer. Uh, Peter Tromba, OEIB. Daniel Ledesma, Education Policy Advisor. Okay, great. Okay, we've got some folks who just joined us. Hi, it's always nice to stand children. And you're standing, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> They're sitting. It's in. Who's on the, uh, the telephone here? Like to introduce yourselves? Anybody there? Okay. When I left uh, this morning, uh, my wife says, hey, you wore that tie on Friday. And I says, it's kind of unique because uh, I had an opportunity to speak at the OSP with Oregon State Penitentiary System for graduates for the two-year two -year deal. And I thought it was kind of a segue into what we're all about. Maybe we would cut down that 14,600 people sitting over there. Uh, all of the education definitely is definitely the key. So, so kind of a... Oxymoron here. We're at the foundation of this to slow that, that incarceration down. Okay, Peter, you're going to uh, lead us off here and get this uh, get this ball rolling for the second half of our investments, huh? Great. Uh, thanks very much, everybody on the committee, for coming back for a second go round. <clears throat> um, where we're going to start is exactly where we left off in the last PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> exactly right. And there's, the PowerPoint presentation is different based on the input from members of the committee. Uh, but I want to refresh everyone's memory on where we stopped. And it was on this slide or one right after it. And what it calls to mind is that in the meeting, we had looked at investment recommendations from an original set of 30 that now there was a smaller set that had received staff uh, higher rankings and we actually talked about every single one of these individual um, investment or policy recommendations at the meeting. On a few there was consensus but on most there was discussion and debate not necessarily total agreement uh, I think we might go into some specific ones of these later in the meeting, but I do want to say based on feedback, if you could mute your phone, please, that would be great. Are we muted because it's blinking? Hi, folks on the phone, welcome to the OEIB Outcomes and Investments <laughs> Subcommittee. If you'd like to introduce yourselves, please. Pam, are you on the line? Okay. So we, we had some discussion on these. We didn't have 100% consensus. Ever since that meeting, those discussions have been uh, topic number one with uh, Dr. Golden and other members of the OEIB staff. And I do want to say that where we sit in the process right now is these recommendations that have been brought forward by agencies and other groups are still under discussion and improvement not just based on the input from the OEIB board, but also input from the field and input from other agency folks. So, and I imagine that that's gonna continue based on the input we get here. And it would take this entire meeting to go back through this list, but there's probably particular ones that folks are gonna to wanna to pull out. 
the other thing that happened at the last meeting was you folks looked at those seven boxes or six boxes and started to talk about combining them in some way so that we had fewer large topics. And actually, Pam Curtis at the meeting was kind enough to actually map out a way to look at all these different investments and what kind of investments are they? Are they systems change? Are they impact, collaborative impact models, and so on? And so we took that input and today have reorganized these into just three major topics. And I want to share those major topics with you in just a second. You also have some handouts with you that also have those major topics. In addition, after we worked on those major topics, we as a staff looked at some of the investments that did not make this list, and we've added some. And in each case, the reason we've added it is going to take a little bit of exploration, so I've got a slide to talk to you about why we added things, and we can go over in some depth. And then that'll really complete the new information for today's presentation. You'll probably have a ton of questions. You might have new ones that you want to suggest. But really, we'll get to a final or a penultimate slide that will ask you, OK, now that you've seen the packages, what's missing? Which ones do you want to dig into more? Are there things that are not on that list that you've been thinking of for the last 10 days that you want to get added, and so on? So when you went back and did this internal process, does that include thinking about the fact that one of our boxes is empty? The one that says other? No, the one above that. Yes. As a matter of fact, a great deal of time went into STEM, CTE, and workforce. Uh, part of it, to your question of why STEM and not other curricular areas, and I think the, the answers are really powerful, so I'm looking forward to talking about that one. Okay. Hannah. So the things that we asked for more research on some of the proposals, is that coming? Yes, uh, definitely a lot of that's been done by Oregon Department of Ed, and Sarah's here. Some of it's to STEM, and Mark is here. Some of it had to do with proposals that Hilda's groups, various groups have brought forward. So we have some more expertise on the ground here to answer. Uh, so yes, and rather than me parroting what they said, I think they're going to be able to, to answer those as we go through it. So luckily we have a good bit of time set aside for individual analysis of them. So the first thing is grouping them differently. The grouping them differently work, this is where we've arrived at this point. Obviously, things can continue to be looked at. But the three groupings are the following. First is third grade reading with sort of a subtitle, Ready for Kindergarten. You're not going to get students 100%, 90% of students ready for third grade reading unless most of those students are ready for kindergarten. The data is really clear on that. But what we also talked about here as a group, and, and I hope Pam does join because she added a lot to that discussion, the focus on third grade reading is a motivating factor all the way into early learning. That those word play, all the story time, all those kind of things that get the pre-literacy skills are absolutely critical to, to the actual reading skills that start when students are in elementary school. But we didn't want to leave out ready for kindergarten. And you know on your handout, and we will come to this in more detail later, it's really prominently displayed. Because for a lot of folks in healthcare or in other related early learning areas, that's their initial focus is ready for kindergarten. So it's a title with a subtitle. So there, I thought Pam had advocated for those being separate. And so what was your thought process for not doing that? My individual conversation with her went back and forth during the meeting to both, and I think we ended with this. It would be trivial to pull it out, but the, and that's why I wouldn't mind having her on the phone. But my last conversation with her was having it together was good. But I'm the will of the committee is my, if that's not where we landed, that's easy enough to pull out. Okay. I, I like this way, but I, I respect Pam on this issue. I mean, I think the ready for kindergarten is really important and arguably could call out. I like the idea of integrating it because I think we're, that is a key theme of all this work is trying to figure out how to work zero through third grade. As long as we're clear that third grade reading is a surrogate for even a larger you know, outcome of well-balanced, well-educated young people. And, and I think the readiness to learn helps 
make sure that indicator is clearly in mind. It's a kindergarten readiness, so I like it this way. Yes? I agree, and you know, OEIB is a seamless system mm -hmm. of education with really a focus on transitions, and we know birth through grade three is so critical to get students to meet the third grade proficiency. The other thing is we've been working really hard with them on a number of things. We've had our reading equity group, um, that has included people from early learning. Our reading campaign that really focuses on story time, every day, every day, everywhere, is really about talking to your children, playing with your children, singing to your children, storytelling. That all starts starts at birth and moves mm -hmm. forward. So, um, to me, it is it, it signals that this is an integrated system. That's what we've been working on. But in the transition, that we have benchmarks so that we can grade ourselves. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, I mean, that's so there's accountability. Right. Yep. Just, we implemented last year the kindergarten readiness assessment. And I, I think making sure that there's some information that's shared out about that's useful, both, both for the early learning and for the kindergarten. Um, I've, I'm still hearing that people haven't got any information from that assessment to help kindergarten teachers know where the students are, um, so, and I'm not sure how much information was shared back with the early learning. So there's got to be, and you know, we keep adding these assessments that don't really do anything to help the instructors that are working with the students. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this year we'll do a better job of, of using that information. Underneath, the in the grouping, the ones that are not in bold, there's just one that's in bold. These, all of these ones that are highlighted here with um, dots, um, we talked about. So, and we, again, uh, as per the question that Hannah asked earlier, we can go back over these a little bit further in the agenda. There is one that's added, and what I'm going to ask the group to do is, there's the next slide is about all the ones that are added. And so I just want you to notice that there's an ad that we'll be talking about in a couple of minutes. The second, every time PSU wants me to log in, I don't want to log in. Um, <laughs> the next grouping is post-secondary completion with a subtitle of high school completion. Again, highlighting the fact that we're looking for a seamless system. It's not to say that one of these is more important than the other, but there's this ultimate goal of post-secondary completion, and you just can't get there without high school completion. So it's kind of a heading and a subheading. And, and, and again, this one might be, you might say, why don't we pull high school out separate? I think it's the same type of discussion that we had with third grade and ready for kindergarten. Underneath it, again, identically, the not highlighted ones we talked about, the not bolded ones, sorry, and italicized. The not bolded italicized ones we did talk about, the ones that are bold and italicized we did not. I think we referenced a couple of these, but we're gonna actually talk about these five things in a couple minutes with the math instructional technology one being one that Duncan raised at our last meeting together uh, when we were last here together. And the final one is a brand new, a brand new one that um, is meant to encompass prosperous Oregon workforce, kind of however you want to think of it, with the subtitle 404020. 404020 is about college and career readiness and accomplishment, getting you ready for careers and jobs of the future or the present. So the, the title is Prosperous Oregon, subtitle is 404020. And here is where, and again, you've got things bold and highlighted and then things that are not. Here's where I think STEM is going to come in big time in terms of this discussion. The only one that really fit the criteria from our last meeting that we did talk about was the youth and community investment. So this one is kind of sparse. And actually, I think that points out something really important that we should reflect on is the vibrant level of ones on here and maybe the sparse, sparseness here that we can talk about. So this is in direct response to the last meeting to have fewer groupings. And it's either appropriate now or any time during the meeting to reflect back your thoughts on the groupings. 
I think it's good to go a couple steps further before we tear apart the groups and recombine them, but I'm completely open to the thoughts of the group. I'm going to ask, I guess, Nancy, I like the three group things. I like the lists, I like the additions, I think it's great. Uh, I have a question about maybe a fourth box, which is we've talked about, even you know, before the meeting, I talked to you about, you know, shape of the school year, number of school days. Uh, you know, we've talked before, and you talked about, you know, foreign languages, international, you know, all kinds of things here. And the answer to all of those issues really seems to be that they're more appropriately answered at the school district than they are at the state. But I don't know if, the, you know, so what we have here is a sub-list of good ideas. We have the sub-list which are associated with the state financing. I don't know if there's a, an advocacy role or something that we should think about where we say, here are other things we think are good under tight loose, they're not ours to do. Hmm. But, you know, but we would really encourage school districts to look hard at these things. Because I, I think, you know, the debate about, you know, does international studies belong in this list or not? Well, you know, we're not going to have the state funding a massive program. At the same time, school districts should be a lot more serious about it than they are. Uh, the school day kind of thing we were talking about, I mean, there just aren't enough school days in a school year. And I know that has to do with legislative funding, but still, school districts get to make some decisions. So. I don't know, it's not so much a today make the list as it is, I guess, looking to you, Nancy, saying, you know, if there could be something where the, you know, the OEIB was kind of saying, here are other things we think would be really good for school districts to be serious about, even if they aren't things that belong in the governor's budget. That's just a thought. Yeah, I don't see any harm in that as long as, you know, it's... It's kind of it's our bully just... pulpit. Can we use our bully pulpit to say a few yeah. things are important? in our uh, policy and research group to gather some research about how effective are those practices so that we can really right. inform ourselves too. Does it make sense, and this is divulging maybe more of my management style, a lot of people will be thankful they're not working for me, but the list up there how the other 49 states are doing in those categories also, in other words, have a, have a sense of uh, or we're lagging, or and it doesn't it doesn't mean to beat up anybody. I mean, I believe in looking mm -hmm. forward, but still to find out where we are in these in these categories, or, or maybe it's a maybe it's a it's a, a legend that goes with this to show where we are uh, um, with with our we're actually mm -hmm. competing in some sense with uh, our other states mm -hmm. uh, for uh, livability and all of that. And maybe it would be easier to sell the population, the citizen as a whole, to say, hey, we're better than this. We can come together with the, the teachers or, what, or more funding or what have you. And we see that we're, we're uh, you know, 55th out of 50 you know, <laughs> uh, type of thing. Does that make sense? Is that well, sure? I think it would be appropriate for those in research and in OEIB and others to do that. When we, when we allow others to grade our state, sometimes they look at, yes. say, high school graduation to pick one. Oregon has a very different definition of a graduate than other states. Right. And actually, if we had a similar definition, we probably wouldn't be ranked. If we all had the same definition, the rankings might look different. So I th I'd love a swing at that particular topic. And you just not to spend any more time on this. The problem is that's what's out there in the PR world. And when I leave this building and go to my own, then that's what I'm asked about. How come we're at this X, Y, and Z? So uh, there's a really good, John Deponia has a really nice piece on this high school graduate that pretty clearly shows that what you just said yeah. by looking at two other benchmark. Can offer it. So, I okay. so to it. respond to Ron, and I, was, I really like this as well. I might tweak the naming of a bit, but. Um, I mean, it seems to me what this really, uh, this to me is Nancy and the governor's document in the sense, this sense of saying there's a lot of great work going on and we're trying to fund all, you know, as much as we can with the resources we have. And this certainly doesn't cover everything that's going on in Oregon education. But in this period ahead, we are marking some outcomes that are critically important for the whole system. The third grade reading, completion of high school and going on to college, um, and connecting you know, education and training with careers. I mean, if we say those are the three big things and we're going to try to measurably improve in those three areas in the next two years, I think you've got a compelling story to tell. And then we have a lot of other things. And under that, we're going to work on English language learning. There's some subcomponents which can need to be called out as part of that. We're going to work on attendance. But you've got these broad 
thematic, the, thematic goals that you can call out. And I think if we do all this work, we will, in fact, measurably improve in each of these areas in about two years. And that would be exciting for Oregon no, to see that. So, so I'm really... I'm, I'm, but we got to that whole discussion about being able to make it a, a marketable story. This is a lot better than when we started. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks to your input. I think when you ask the question, Ron, about what it, you know, some best practice, the QEC, the report actually outlines what our schools should look like. And I think, you know, when, when I asked for the QEC to come to this board and share information, it was to really outline what is in the plan. Not the number, because nobody wants to talk about a number, but actually talk about how you build those learning conditions. So how many days, how many students, what programs, all of those things are clearly in there. And I think it would be well worth our time as as a full board to really look at it and say, if we really want to get where we want to go, this is where we should be. All of these additional things, these are strategic investments, okay, but we're not going to get all students there by making strategic investments. A small amount of students are going to get a grant from the district to be able to do, have access to some things. That's great. But we have 40, 40, 20 by 20, 25. If we're going to get there, we got to start moving the dial in a bigger way. And, and I, I don't know what this number is that we're looking at. With all of these things up here, what, what number is that? And where's that number coming from out of the, out of the budget? So I guess when we get to that conversation, it will help us understand where we're really going. Any more com comments yeah. on this? The, the two th thoughts on the, the titles. Um, I just, if we're going to say include post secondary, I think just high school and post secondary completion rather than just one word. And then on the 404020 in Prosperous Oregon, I think we've got to distinguish, again, this theme we've talked about earlier the pipeline with adult learners. And the, this last one on, if you will, if, the way I would call it is connecting education and training to careers. Mm -hmm. And for the adult population, I think the focus we've talked about, at least at the heck, and Ben can chime in if you want, but is to focus on those who need the education training the most. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're not going to get all adults to 40, 40, 20, but we need to focus on those adults who need the training the most. And so I would just focus on connecting education and training to careers, both for the pipeline and for adults, with a particular emphasis on the adults that need it the most. If that makes sense. And, and then on the, 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 then the first one, really, or the second one, High school and college completion really speaks to that pipeline, the young people coming through it. And I, I, I keep that, those two populations in mind separately. I think it helps. We can come back to the groupings. I would like now to just, let's take a look at the additions and some justification or explanation for why they're on there. First, and um, well, I'll just one by one. First one, uh, expansion of school district partnership that is a research-tested, tried-and-true, Oregon-specific success story that many districts in our state have already benefited from and show actual test score. And I know test scores are not the end-all, be-all. I understand that. But schools that are employing the techniques of this um, intervention are showing test score increases in the students in those districts involved. And to look at actual hard data of work with teachers that changes things like test scores because it's so muddy sometimes and different schools and different conditions, to see that research so clear uh, made it rise to the top in our eyes as one to put back on the list. Uh, it's also known as the class um, project. Uh, so that's why that's been added to the list. And I want to note that it's... On the handouts that we have, it's on two of the handouts. On this one, it's just on this handout, um, Expansion of School District Collaboration. I didn't repeat it over in this box, but it does apply to, to, to high school, too. It really was just a question of fitting enough stuff on one slide. Um, so that's why Expansion of School District Partnerships is on there. And I think on each of these, it's appropriate just to stop and see if there are questions about each one. So I'll stop talking on that first one. So just tell me when we have sort of what it looks like then. Can Stand I stand from what to what? Can I speak to that? Because yeah. the district I was superintendent um, was part of this. For it, 
it basically has uh, administrators and teachers, particularly the teacher association, working together on four things. Powerful staff development, powerful teacher evaluation, multiple pathways to leadership, and alternative forms of compensation. So um, for a lot of districts, and I know for us, I, I just uh, remember when we used to teach new teachers about classroom management and we did a pretty good job but then when teachers started teaching it they set their classrooms up ahead of time they had the teachers out in their classrooms I mean I think it really allows the, the expert teachers to really help train <coughs> other teachers so it's very powerful it's very so how many districts today and how many districts if we expanded it I think about half. It's about 40% as I recall. 40? You think yeah, for a class right now. Is this to take it to 100%? Or this to take it to 100% or what's the proposal? Uh, I mean, well, the proposal, I believe, is expansion. And I think this is one of those sliding scale ones is how far could it go? I don't know. I personally don't know if there's a number. It says 200,000. Do you want to tell us? Is it 40% of it? It's currently 40% of students. In Oregon are involved in a district that are either involved or is the uh, school district collaboration fund funding or teacher incentive fund funding. Um, and I think the answer on the expansion is who's ready because uh, a district uh, can only go forward if the school board, the superintendent, and the EA uh, are all on board with tackling these conversations. Um, so there's been some uh, there's definitely, because of the last legislative round of funding, which took it, it started with $5 million of funding. The last legislative session, it was uh, grown to $12.3 million. Uh, we've taken a look at what some of the uh, interest level, uh, because people had to, school districts had to step up if they were interested in these grants. So we know that there's more demand than there is funding uh, at the $12 million level currently that it's at. Um, but it remains to be seen what will be in the upcoming biennium. Is that helpful? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. How many actual districts? I, no, I don't want to say 26, but that's off yeah. the top of my head. Yeah. Somebody said that, yes. 26. That sounds about right. 26, so it's scaling it up to get everyone ready. And I, um, we've been involved with class, helping our locals. And um, the collaboration where they're ready where they're ready, it really works. When they're talking about professional development, evaluation, and leadership, it's worked. So um, it's nice to have the time to be able to actually talk about what does good professional development look like, but to scale it up to get from 26 to 197 districts. Do we have a sense of how many are ready at this point? Uh, you're putting me on the spot. Sorry. I, one of the things I would point out, though, because it's interesting, because you look at the, uh, the school district, the number, of course, we've got a lot of school, small school districts out there. Uh, and so there is a consortium work that's being done in uh, John Day, Grant, and Harney counties that will capture like 20 school districts in one fell swoop. But of course, that's because there are a lot of small school districts out uh, in that part of the state. Um, so. Okay, thank you. One of the things that happened with this is it, it went from the class and then it got involved in the TIF grant from the federal government. And that's caused a lot of angst in the system because of some of the things that are tied in that. So if we move forward, will it be involved in the TIF or is this? No, that, that's, those are one time federal funds so that are kind of going out. away. Um, and so really it's. You know, the, the foundations in Oregon help kind of jumpstart this work, but to take it to scale is, is ultimately going to require state-level investment. Uh, so. Okay, the second one, STEM hubs. So if those of you at the last meeting will remember, a question was raised about, one question was raised about STEM, which was why that's at STEM, for those of you who don't know, science, technology, engineering, and math also known as other names, STEAM and other things, to include other topics. Why is there a call out for one particular curricular area uh, above all others? I mean, obviously, reading is there, third grade reading, but why is STEM called out? And, and really, the, a couple answers to that. One is, 
that one of the biggest barriers to students graduating high school and making it into college is mathematics. And math, divorced from science or engineering or technology, is not that interesting a subject to most people. It's the integration of math in some applied way that really can make it jazzy and interesting. Uh, as a science person who also taught math, I, I taught all my science, uh, math through science. So it, it's important to one of the biggest barriers to high school graduation that there is, is this idea of integrating mathematics in other areas. It's also the number one economic opportunity for students leaving either uh, high school or post-secondary to get good careers. There's a, there's, and this is something, again, that Educate, Echo Northwest has provided for us. There's lots and lots of jobs out there in these fields, and the pipeline is not preparing enough for Oregon. In addition, there's lots and lots of jobs all over the globe in STEM, and right now, Oregon is hiring folks from all those places to fill Oregon jobs. It's a very hydraulic situation where if Oregon was producing enough computer programmers, they'd have work. They could live in this city, but they could be working in all kinds of other places, telecommuting. So the reason it's called out, and I did interview a bunch of people after that question because I was stuck at the meeting. Oh, good point. Why was that? It was the, the combination of integration in school makes math a better subject to teach and learn, but the economic workforce argument again and again and again came up. It is an opportunity... For, for kids' future, and that's why. And there may be some future where there's some other uh, economic opportunity that would rise to the level that STEM does, but that, those are some primary arguments. So we put instructional and economic imperative on there. We also put the word collective impact. The idea of a STEM hub is you get people from diverse backgrounds, not just the school system, working together, and it's called a hub, or spinning around the central idea and everybody contributing together to impact something collectively. We've got regional achievement collaboratives in our state. We've got uh, early learning hubs in our state. The STEM hubs are of that ilk. They're the same family. And if we believe in collective impact, it's another reason why the STEM hubs, we believe, should be back on the list. So let me just add, and I support the STEM hub being there, and I love science and math. It's great. But, but, but calling it out separate from other things. For instance, I was reading some stuff last week where um, employers and, and universities were saying the most important skill is ability to communicate. And so, well, we're saying it's important to read, and we're saying it's important to be able to do math because that's tied to things. But we don't ever talk about can people communicate effectively. Well, presumably think that's part of the high school, you know, graduation requirements and something the school districts are supposed to work on. So I still, have, I'm not concrete change, I'm just observing. We still feel a little to me like we're picking some things out here and that, you know, we could be talking about how, you know, science and math is important to a lot of jobs. Communication of skills is important to every job I can think of. But, so, we'll go forward. I'm just noting okay. I'm not entirely convinced that we're not still kind of violating our tight loose here. Because you said Eco Northwest has provided something, but I go back to, and I know I've asked for this before, so maybe I'll ask again, the employment, the Oregon employment, looking forward. Can we get some research from them that shows those jobs, what's available, what we're not filling, so that we can look at that as well? And I know I've seen stuff like that mm -hmm. presented at the yeah. higher ed. Ben? quickly address it because we have a project underway, I think partly at, at um, your request, Hannah, but I know it, it's been a topic of OEFN Heck conversation to more clearly to work with the Department of Employer Employment and their forecasters to more clearly identify the labor market trends and the associated um, degrees and credentials, high school diplomas, certificates, basically educational level, education attainment levels associated with those projected job opening. So we're in the process of doing that research now. I expect to be bringing that back um, first to the commission and then to the OEIB, presuming there's interest um, later later this month, actually. Great. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. And echoes, well, we can come back to it, but the, the big point Echo makes is the, the key in labor markets are wages, and the wages for STEM graduates are way, way higher, which shows the demand. And, uh, and if we want to raise income and reduce poverty, this is a, one of the, the paths, I think. 
but, but which good. is where I keep hearing different information because that's that's yeah. not what I heard the last time the employment. Yeah, we'll, we'll pull here, it out. So we should confirm that because I, I I think you'll see we 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 should get that in front until you clarify that. But I think I'm quite confident. The the piece of back to, to Ron's though. I, again, I think Pegasus keeps coming back to the thing we're saying we want to stand out. And I would argue, yeah, we are taking some stands in the the, the legislature adopted legislation last time to suggesting that we need to dramatically increase the number of STEM graduates, double them. And I forget the number, Mark. What's the proficiency in math proficiency to grow at the number of who exceed on the, the... The current proficiency level for all students is around 40%. For our African-American and Latino populations, it's around 18 and 19%. And it's, to, it's the proficiency. It, the proficiency in math at all levels, to I think, and, and to increase for everybody, including those of color. And so we've got a legislative mandate to say, let's take a stand and do this. And so again, we want to improve the whole system, but let's take math on as a specific opportunity and show dramatic improvement. I think that's you know, the kind of, we're not gonna, we can't fix everything at once. <laughs> and let's, let's get some things done that are quite important and will help build momentum for the whole. I don't think there's any more highly debated subject at a district level than the math curriculum, especially over the last eight years about what should we be using, and there's huge debate over the best techniques. And so that's been, a, I think, another in, in the education world struggle that we've gone through um, to figure out how do we best prepare students. Um, something hopefully our STEM group can help us with. Yep. The next two are uh, going on currently and being discussed currently by Accelerated Learning. They're blended advising and dual credit. Blended advising did come through the process. It was presented to all of you. And for a variety of reasons, it didn't get scored when we scored some of the other ones. So we went back and looked at it. And it made it onto the list, again, mainly based on research and evidence. So just to refresh your memory, the notion is that the transition between high school and post-secondary, and especially the opportunity for students to take and earn college credit while in high school, is affected to a great deal by whether or not the two systems link together and there's a seamless linkage between those two systems. And blended advising is a proposal to do just that, is to build that bridge for students from 12th grade to the next step. Uh, and if there's uh, follow-up questions on it, Hilda Roselli has come up to discuss it. It's something that's come out of the discussion about dual credit as a, as a key strategy in order to get more students through the high school and through the college process completing. Oh, my gosh. No, I don't want to be on the internet. Thank you. <laughs> the second one is dual credit. I'll just say both of them, and then maybe we can take them together. There's a committee called Accelerated Learning, and Nancy chairs that committee, and they are discussing ways to get dual, more dual credit. Again, our goal as a state is every kid gets three college-level courses completed in high school for an equivalent of nine credits, college credits. And the dual credit work, the Accelerated Learning Work Group has a proposal with regards to dual credit that's currently in process. It's not really our proposal, per se, but we thought including it on the list made a lot of sense because it's right there in our wheelhouse in terms of the high school and post-secondary completion. So, so have, not having it there almost begs the question, well, why isn't that there? Even though it's not something that we're looking to fund through our recommendations, per se, but it has another group who's focused on that. So both of those have made it onto our list for that reason, and I'll just again stop with questions some of which might be held as to answer. I'd just like to add that um, as the Accelerated Learning Committee worked all year long um, under Nancy's leadership, it became very clear that we could make some inroads in increasing access in certain schools that were not offering options to students, but to just focus on the course availability alone was missing a critical piece, and that is that if students don't start to think very early on about my own college and career planning, 
then having the opportunity to take classes, which needs to be there, shouldn't depend on your zip code, but that's only half of the equation. And so what we looked at were successful models that are building a culture very early on with students where they begin to, to really look ahead, make those plans, and to be able to benefit from the resources that both a, a school district and some of their post-secondary partners can bring to that equation. For example, we have a, a individual learning and career plan that's terribly underutilized. Yes. We think that an investment in bringing our totally school district agree. partners, our community, industry, and secondary, post-secondary partners together, we could really make that a tool that worked for students. And it's customizable. It could even be linked into the longitudinal data system. Couldn't help but share that. Thanks for that call out. So questions from the group about the blended advising and dual credit additions? So I think, so, go ahead. So I, I, I don't obviously haven't heard the report, but I think this definitely should be on the agenda again under the theme. We're picking out an outcome. We're going to put all the budget and policy in one place to show the legislature how it all fits together. I think this is really important to tie it in. Hannah? I was just trying to go back. It's 11 and 12 on our sheet here that we were looking at. Um, and I was trying to remember exactly what, the, what they do. I'm sorry. So the first one is just, it's seed? Right. So just do it uh, th that's why it's listed as a strategic investment for the blended advising. We believe that's the responsibility of the, the school districts to carry that out. But there needs to be some convening to actually look at where are we in terms of who provides what types of services, how are we maximizing and building a, a, a program <coughs> that starts at fifth grade on and helps students at each level be ready? So we think that's a convening and an opportunity to support them in a plan that's developed over a one-year time frame. Then it's really the district's responsibility to carry that plan out. So in looking at like our rural districts that have a really hard time, so be digging in the weeds a little bit with them to look for best practice. Oh, and I see where you are now. See, I don't have that sheet in front of me. So the seed funding for the, um, the districts that do not have any offerings or might, might only have one offering or they stopped offering, that seed funding brings together their post-secondary partner or someone else in the region that is willing to work with the school district to make offerings available. They need to sit down together to find what would be the best fit for the students in the community? How do we get instructors qualified? Will it be a delivery system that's face-to-face -face or online, partially? Um, all of those kinds of decisions. So it is seed funding to get those partnerships started. And that articulation between K-12 and community college or higher ed. Absolutely. Other questions about blended advising or dual credits inclusion on our list? Is Aspire, where does Aspire fit in this? Because I know that's in a higher ed, but that's potentially in the splendid advising. Aspire is one of the partners yeah. that we're okay. working with around okay. creating this, but they're not even able to spread across the entire state right. to do all the services. What I think they are doing is a great convening and pulling together resources yeah. that then the school districts if right. we embed Maybe. that together could actually use. Because in the higher ed budget, we have an increase in Aspire funding, and of course that, so we probably need to get that somehow blended in. in here as well. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. The next one came from our last committee meeting, and I don't know if this is correctly titled, given what Duncan said, but this is what I heard, and maybe we need to improve the title. But the notion is, again, it's about math being a barrier to higher education success and high school graduation, and it's a recognition of the fact that every day there's new technology, that uh, assists students in learning. And with math being such a tough nut to crack, we put in uh, math instructional technology, 10 through 14 being grade 10 to second year of college, that we're not wedded to that age range at all. It's really a placeholder. Uh, so I've noted it was a subcommittee member suggestion. And uh, there is research and evidence on all kinds of different approaches to, to teaching. 
Um, something that Mark and I had a conversation about just this morning, something we need, if this is something that goes forward, there's strong feeling among the board to look into this. This is something, honestly, we need to do more research in um, to just determine what best practice really is to affecting students, especially, especially those most affected by the gap at getting good instructional research. Probably everybody's heard of Khan Academy. Um, and some of us have benefited from watching Khan Academy or seeing a flipped classroom or something like that. So there are examples where it's really, really powerful uh, instructional intervention. So it's on the list based on subcommittee input, and I'll just see what the, what the committee thinks at this point. Duncan, do you like it? I like it. But I, so here, and I, Mark and I have talked about this, and, and I actually talked with Ed Ray is looking at... Like, here's two, two problems. One is we know... Consistently talking to high school, community college, and higher ed faculty and math, the systems aren't aligned properly. So that, and when you get them in the room, they understand. And there's been a lot of work. The Eastern Promise, I think, I think down in Eugene, you worked on that, Nancy. If I recall certainly. I know Ed Ray's got a whole project project right now, and that's simply getting the standards aligned so we know what we're talking about. So that we, we have too often the case when a student leaves high school thinking they're proficient and ready for college math, they find out they're not. And that's just not fair to the student who, you know, doing well. Um, and we have to figure out how to align the systems. The second, and, and the second piece is um, there are a lot of tools now available to help assess students and understand where they are. And I've been looking at them, the Khan Academy. There are a number of them. I have no idea what the right ones are. But we're getting a lot better through adaptive assessment and learning tools to help use those tools to know where students are. And I think we ought to be leading on that as a state. At least some that we don't use all of them. Idaho, for example, is very big on the Khan Academy. They're using it pretty pervasively now in a number of districts. And then the third, to Hannah's point, there's a whole question of what do we mean, what are the math standards, and what's proper instructional practice, whatever, whether they're using the new tools or, or not. And it just strikes me, again, with the STEM goals that we've established, Mark isn't here, but in math proficiency, um, which are pretty ambitious, um, and understanding, as Nancy's talked about, the use of technology, we need to think about how we apply technology and use it in instruction. It just strikes me, this is an area where, as a state, we ought to, again, call it out, um, put some resource to it, and figure out how to, whether it's 10 through 14, I don't know, but how do we really think about math instruction differently with technology, with the best teaching practices, and making sure that it's aligned across the system. I just think that's a priority we ought to be focusing on in the next two years, and really try to try to bring math faculty together. I, know, I don't know what the answer is, what we will ultimately come up with, but to think about what, what does math education look like in the 21st century and how do we make sure we're applying the best practice here in Oregon. So I missed the notion of alignment on there, so that seems very critical. I think it's, it's I've, again, I've heard it more than, at Steve Pat Burke back there, when we at the state board meetings, we've done this over 10, 15 years, it consistently comes up when you bring faculty together. How does that relate to the Common Core standards that you've just adopted, all the math standards? Are you looking at changing those standards? Mm -hmm. But those Common Core have not been extended into higher ed. That's the problem. I mean, it's that kind of, that's, that's the issue. I mean, how do we make sure that we're aligning, that the higher ed folks, all the, the, the standards are, are carried on into <coughs> higher ed? Um, and then again, the, and then having assessment and teaching tools to do it. And what's the best instructional method to get to the Common Core? So I think there's a whole lot of desire by educators to have the time to unpack the standards and figure mm -hmm. these standards out. And I'm sure the higher ed faculty haven't had an opportunity to dig into them as well. But I'm, so I'm not understanding what this would look like. What this would be, to me, this would be an investment in, again, we'd have to build this out, but I would, to my mind, Three, three different pieces. One is bringing faculty together to talk about math instruction and the standards alignment. The second would be looking at use of technology as an instructional tool, both for classroom practice and as, as well as for assessment so that students could know where they are and how they, you know, to, to track their progress along the math continuum. And then finally, um, I think there would be a piece related to course um, sort of making sure all the courses are aligned with each other as we do this work so that an algebra class in high school means the same thing as an algebra class in community college and so forth so that we have a common understanding of what we mean by math instruction um, so that the, the pipeline is far more seamless as we say. And, and again, 
it's really the idea we have for the whole education continuum. I just think it's the most, math is the one that I think we could crack earliest and, and most effectively. And if we could do it there, then we can then demonstrate it in other subject areas down the road. But this, this recommendation of alignment, though, needs to be put in that box that we're talking about, or the bullet pulpit, or whatever you want to talk about. Well, we do have a national expert in Oregon, Dave Conley, yeah. Epic, that's yeah. specifically what they've been working on, the connected Ed Lane County, one of our regional achievement collaboratives, has looked just at that. How do we work with K-12 plus the higher ed partners to articulate standards, and not only standards, but how do we use the same assessment? Mm -hmm. So, and there's even talk, and I don't think we're there yet, but if students do things like pass the ACT or one of those uh, tests, that that should count in terms of, um, saying if you pass that, you wouldn't even need to take the test to figure out if you're going to developmental ed or not, because developmental education is another to look at, you know, areas we need to focus on and maybe redesign because they're not getting the results I think we all want for our students. So I, I do think that this is critically important in terms of the transitions, the core transitions and the success in high school to be successful in college and in college to be successful in the, in the uh, working world. Needless we'll to say, this needs some development. If we, can do it. That, we just burned up an hour, so how are we doing? We're doing great. Okay. Absolutely great. Keep rolling. So I'm not sure what the pleasure of the group is on this one. There's obviously lots of regional, regional achievement collaborative work going on in this. It's not a fleshed out proposal. I, I suppose it can... It can sit in the status that it's in right now, which is a, a, a new proposal. Um, I'd suggest, you should, since you just walked in, Mark, I suggest we ask Mark to see if he can oh, flesh it out. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, he knows. We can certainly come back yeah. on that one. The next one is also a parallel process, the personal achievement record. The statewide longitudinal database, one element of it that Hilda referred to a couple of minutes ago, is the fact that part of it is for students and families to understand their own achievements and to understand what the future could hold for them. Uh, that's going on already. It's not really funded through this recommendation, but it is an OEIB project. It does tightly couple the work that's going on with regard to students finishing college and getting a career. Uh, so I think it's important to call out that it's not off on the side. It's actually right dead center in the middle of a lot of the ideas that we're discussing. It just hasn't been something we brought to the committee because we've been arguing for it in front of the legislature. and It's in statute that we're supposed to be doing it. But we did call it out and put it in here. And when Hilda talks about blended advising and about students supposed to start in the seventh, who are supposed to start in the seventh grade thinking about their future, one of the reasons it doesn't work right now is because in most districts it's on paper. It's in a folder. And it doesn't necessarily follow them anywhere. And the idea of this is something that would be portable to every Oregonian that they'd be able to keep track of what they've achieved um, through their whole life. But especially to the critical years of, they say, seventh grade to age 25-ish when big decisions are getting made. So that's going to happen anyway because you folks have already voted on that. But we thought it was important to put that in the context of the other Investments. Any questions on the personal Wait, achievement you say record? The personal record for your whole life. You get any redos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I mean, I think conspiracy people are going to go nuts over that one. Well, it's like it's a place. Right now, the the system already keeps track of every grade you got. The question is, can you find every grade you got, or how easy is it to get your can. high school transcript? Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> It's about empowering individuals to have something that the system now holds right now. It's more powerless, not less. Ron, go ahead. The, the next slide's about your personal microchip. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> right. This is really important. The next That's one important. is high school equivalency. This is a proposal that came directly from the, the uh, Equity and Partnership Subcommittee. And if you remember, that was the, one of the meetings I didn't attend. My colleague, Shandeen, presented that one to you folks. The reason it's back on the list, even though it did not uh, get the sufficient votes initially, it, are two, really. The, the impact in terms of immediately affecting kids who've dropped out of high school and who have no way to get a high school equivalency other than this 
is pretty enormous when you count the number of high school non-completers we have. In Oregon, we've got 70% or so of the kids falling out of the pipeline who are not making fifth year completion. That's a lot of, that's a huge reservoir of students who if they could get their completion, they can move on to secondary or a career. Uh, it's also high school equivalency or the GED has gotten much more rigorous over the last couple of years. It's much more difficult to pass and much more indicative of college and career readiness. And then to be honest, it's a recommendation from, from another subcommittee. And uh, at least for now, staff felt it was important to have it back on the list. It's going to be presented at the full board meeting in a week. And so not having it there seemed like a glaring omission because it fills a need that affects so many Oregon students right now, especially those 18 to 25 years old. So my question, not if it's for you or you, but um, the original assignment was to prioritize things, not to get hung up on numbers. Our priority list now has like 40 things on it. Um, are they just 40 things of equal priority that we're presenting, or it's starting to feel like an awfully long list to just say they're all our priority. Is that our assignment? I mean, that's what our assignment is. Our assignment is to say, here are 40 things we're done, or is it to say, you know, these 10 are more important than these 30, or? Is that, is that me? I'm not sure of that. Is. Well, I think what we did, and there are, maybe we should talk about how many are not on the list anymore, but we tried to say. No, I know it could need, be 120, but it's still 30 Well, we need to create <laughs> systems. I mean, these leverage each other. So I think our feeling is that, um, these are grouped in a way that we believe when you combine them, it's going to really leverage us to an outcome we're looking for. And I think that was one of the big criteria in, as we went through our first step process and now as we're analyzing it for the second step process. So if we end up with three boxes in between them, they've got 30 or 40 items in it, you've done our job and everybody's, ha everybody's happy? Yeah, but don't we want to appeal to any note which gives us the best return for investment? I mean, you talk about that high school equivalency. If, if we drop the ball on that one, you're talking about huge dollars in Department of Human Services, you know, you know, Oregon Youth Authority, Department of Corrections. You're talking about weight on the, you know, they're not being productive in the community. Of, uh, but that's what triggered me to ask the question. Yeah, it's, it's a big ticket item. So. Are yeah. we supposed to say, move it to the top of the list because yeah. it's really important? Yeah, exactly. Or just leave it in the 40 somewhere and somebody else well, figure out where it fits? I, I think at least staff needs to go back and really think about this and bring back proposals because some of these things could um, don't necessarily take resource. Some right. take doing existing resources yep. differently. Some take additional resources. Some are things you want to bully pulpit or you want to inspire districts in there are tight, loose, loose. But you know, I know when we start working closely with the OSBA, take third grade reading for example, and we talk oftentimes school boards for example would say, you know, talk to our board members about setting a goal around that. So I think there's lots of different things we can do with these and we still have to sort that you know, out. I'm getting less than a nod over here though. I mean, is, have we done our job if we just say here's the list of 40 things? Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, this is a very powerful committee and that you get to sort of set what your priorities are and, to, and, and I think the governor, the governor is going to use these, this as a way to help develop his budget and takes your advice very seriously. So if there are, if you want to set, I mean, it feels like you want to set some priority within that. I think you could, you could ask staff to, to make that priority. You could sort of say this is where we, you know, stop. I think the... The challenge is, is that you know in this environment, you know we obviously want to try to see how we can increase the budget for education, but there is that need to sort of talk and discuss trade-offs. So I think that to assume that everything on this list and, and more could potentially receive funding, you know, the, the more specific you could be for the government, I think, the more helpful. Well, that's that's the yeah, that's the I don't know the answer to that, but when you sit and talk about. All those third grade reading things cost a lot of money. Um, this, you know, high school equivalency costs a lot of money. If we're supposed to say one of those things is more important than the other, I don't feel very well equipped to do that. That's not the debate or discussion we've had. Well, so maybe if I hear where we are in the process, if 
if we come up with this list, and say, what I hear Nancy and Peter saying is we're, we're developing strategies to achieve these outcomes, and their combination of policy changes, shifts in funding, mm-hmm. new funding, a, a set of different kinds of things that if you put together will lead to the outcome. Now, what we don't know is whether we can afford all those pieces, and but we are committed to the outcome. So I guess what I'm picturing is going back when we finish our work and coming up with more fleshed out proposals and then taking a look at what they cost and then we may have to take I mean, the governor, somebody's going to make some decisions. I don't know if we give more feedback at that point about, okay, we understand we don't have enough to do all this, we need to make some choices, but I, what I like about this is we are coming up with a series of strategies that will lead to the outcome that are, I do think they're all interconnected, um, but we obviously haven't figured out you know, whether we can afford all of them or um, but we also have to weigh, though, if we spend a dollar, are we going to get $5 back? If we spend a dollar over here, we're going to get $2 back, so to speak, on that. Okay. But then when do we peel the onion, though, and talk about some of the things that, that Ron said at the beginning, and then for, it comes to my mind, how about attendance? We, you know, mm-hmm. Is that, is that, part, is that, is that attendance yeah. at, in school? Is that part of our, is that part of our, our, our uh, privy, too? Do we want to put that in this whole diploma thing? I mean, the high school equivalency, yes. Us, yes. So I, I appreciate the conversation about return on investment because some of these, and I think why we have to have more time to really, if this is your list, to think, you know, what would we do first or second. If you're saying that third grade reading, four times as many kids graduate from high school, well, maybe we won't need as many kids needing the high school equivalency eventually because we've just created a strategic investment that the return on investment is supposed to really help with some of these others. So, of course, in the meantime, there's kids right now who need the high school equivalency. So I think there's a way we could analyze this to really prioritize and um, really think about, you know, there's some of these you might need for a while and you don't need for the wrong Yeah, I think it still comes down to discussion I know we all don't want to have. When we get our list done and it has 30 or 40 things on it, If you all think you can fit all 30 or 40 of those into the state budget, great. I'm a happy guy. Let's go home. Um, But if you look at it and say, well, we can't possibly fit all 30 or 40 of those into the state budget, or the governor says that, then the question is, well, okay, then do you want to tell us you want to know which ones we think should be in the budget out of those? I mean, if it only can be half of them, do you want us to tell you which half? Or do you just want to take the list of 30 or 40 and the governor or legislature decide? That, to me, is ultimately we get to... If it can all fit in the budget, great. But if it can't all fit in the budget, is any part of our assignment to give you a priority about which parts we think should fit in if the funds aren't sufficient for everything? But you know, Ron, you've never been a budget in your life. You haven't you prioritized. You just don't throw a bunch of stuff into a budget. you got to know what, yeah. what, what, what's, what's what's what. So we need to... Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. 10 things. I yeah. kind of feel like, well, 10 things can all kind of be important. When it gets to be 30 or 40, it's uh, yeah. feel kind of like a pretty long list. Yeah. So what if we go back and try to, you know, be able to come back maybe when we go to the, the, the full board with a little bit more information about that? Um, in terms of attendance, because I, I, I would like to talk to that, to where we are with attendance, to a large degree, we really believe if we get some of these right, it will increase attendance. So I know, I mean, I don't want to say I know, but my feeling is when a child does can't read by third grade and then they have to read to learn, it gets a lot harder to go to school when you can't interact with text. So, but in addition to that, this is the year that we're really working with our communities, all of our communities, specifically our communities of color, um, specifically the tribes, the, um, to talk to them about really understanding what is their issues around chronic absenteeism and how can we really do this in a very culturally specific way because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important thing, but it's something I think in, a, in addition to this, we want to take a little bit more time before we suggest an investment on it. But don't get me wrong, we see many of these as an investment in better so, if we I just want to play up what Ron just showed because I want to make sure I understand. These are strategic investments, so we're not 
necessarily looking at new money. We're looking at moving some money around to be able to make investments that we think will really move the dial. So when do we talk about what, where that money is coming from? So in some of the proposals, like the ELL, it's taking money away from somewhere for more money. Where's that coming from? Are we going to get into that? We know that whole day kindergarten is coming on, and we've talked about how important for your reading is, how important full day kindergarten is. The tune is about $220 million. That's not capital included. So where are we going to, what do we think is most important if the governor really wants to hear from us and get our best thinking on it? And I think we have to dig in and say, these are most important, and we have we have a laundry list of really great things, um, some that I don't think have been fully vetted, but how do we prioritize these? If that's not our task, then I'm not sure just giving them three boxes of things that will make a difference, well, that's all well and good, but where's the money coming from to do it? It's taken away from somewhere else, or we get it really up to the budget? And I'm not hearing that as what we're doing. And oh, by the way, we're not talking about widgets. We're talking about people, lives. Okay. So there'll be just. I want to call out that there'll be lots of time for that exact activity if that's the the board wants to do that. Prioritizing. We're almost done on the, the program presentation, so there's lots more chance to to dig back. And if prioritizing is a good activity, we absolutely can do that. Duncan, you were going to ask. So the last. Uh, Two more on this list, and again, I want to note that a number of these are not, that are already going on, even if we stop discussing them, they'd continue. And the next one's that way too, post-secondary talent development. There's a parallel process. This is an existing investment that is training teachers at the university level to be more, um, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but to be more in tune with the needs of workforce uh, for students that are coming out of university. That's what that training is. It, it's to... not really faculty professional development so much as actually providing incentive funding, initial startup funding for uh, post-secondary institutions to actually adapt their programs to meet the changing workforce needs. Thank you. Um, so that's an existing funding. We're, we're looking to expand that to include community colleges. That's why this came before our group. Um, it fits so squarely in the idea of a pathway to career that it seemed among staff that, especially since it's in, going on in parallel, there's already money committed to this activity and will be next year. Uh, it seemed it didn't make sense for us to leave off something where there would be funding associated with it already. Whether it expands or not maybe is a really great discussion for prioritization. And then finally, CTE revitalization. Um, this is, I don't even know if it's exactly the right term. It's not a, a process that we're running at OEIB, uh, but Mark is involved and others are involved. CTE is career and technical education, sometimes lumped in with STEM, but they are different ideas. And CTE revitalization work is happening in parallel and likely would be funded regardless of the activities of this group. But it made sense to put it in there because it's so so... Uh, al aligns so well with the work that we've already suggested. So again, I know there's a long list, but a lot of them would take place whichever way we went. Questions on those last two, especially with Mark available? If there's something I didn't say right about that or questions folks have about that? Well, the only question I guess I have is, you say it's not, I mean, I think the OEIB looks out over the whole education budget, so I Correct. can't see why those wouldn't be in there. Is, is post-secondary really, is that another word for ETIC? Is that what we're talking about? That's extending ETIC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To other so, I mean, those are all, to me, part of the whole continuum Correct. budget priorities, and I think they're, I mean, we need to talk about them, but I certainly think it's in the purview of OEIB's. Yeah, I guess I missed Yeah, not the purview. I, I guess I meant to com convey the idea that it's an already moving. Yeah, they're. They were an existing budget. Topic. Or, yeah. So just a couple more slides, and then we're ready for really um, any questions that you folks have or direction to us, because we have the full board in a week, and we have to decide as a group what we're presenting, who's presenting, how, how we're doing it to, to get that group's um, discussion and, and input. 
Um, so what you have uh, at your table that's not reproduced that well are one pagers that show these different um, buckets. And I want to note my cool green laser pointer, but also what the way the way this has been set up, and this again is Pam Curtis's work from last meeting, is we have listed each of the different investments, number of folks involved, but then we've also said what kind of investment is this? Is it essential skills? That's a language about common core standards or the standards that motivate community college or university instruction. Is this about curriculum and essential skills? Is it a collective impact strategy, like the RACs, the STEM hubs, the early learning hubs? Is it about educator effectiveness? Educators throughout the system doing better, whether they be teachers or principals or deans or what have you. Are they about quality learning environments that have students engage? Someone mentioned earlier attendance. I think Ron mentioned it. Attendance is the number one measure of whether or not you're creating an engaging environment. It's very easy to measure, but you don't change attendance by telling kids to come to school. You change attendance by creating better environment. Well, what define better? I, 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 have, a really, I, have, a, I have a problem with... with uh, Drama, music, and sports, athletics, you know, type of deal. Case where a kid is not doing very well in English, has to take two classes of English, but also the second class that he has to additionally take is at the time he's playing his instrument. Now he doesn't play his instrument anymore, he's not going to school anymore. Because he wasn't there to learn English or whatever this skill, he was there to play his instrument. So, how, you know, how, when do we, do we, is that is that too old fashioned to think about that type of stuff? With, it's a kid in school and keeps him there. Is that part of our, is that curriculum mm -hmm. process? Is that, or is that just too neat? It's, it's a hot topic every single day across Oregon high schools, and the fact that there's having to make decisions between those two is heartbreaking. And I think it's a great, it's a great part of this topic. Uh, that exact thing that you mentioned. You need, the kids need to read, for sure, and then when they don't have that elective opportunity. So, so it's the glue that gets them there, right? It keeps them there. My guess is there's half the people in this room have an opinion, probably a strong one about what you just said. So I don't know if that's really a question to the whole group or. So I'll move on. Um, I, the last one is system redesign. Pam mentioned this at the last meeting. A number of these investments are about reforming the system, and they don't necessarily cost a whole lot of money. Some do, some don't. The some of them are just spending money in different places. I think birth to three is that way, but I'm not 100% sure, Megan. But it did get a system redesign check based on our last meeting. That's the right way to think about it. A lot of what we're thinking about around the infant toddler birth to three agenda is how to use the resources that exist currently for home visiting across a wide variety of types of home visiting programs to be more effective and more focused on the particular needs of families instead of the particular needs of home programs. So that first handout, I'm just going to show the three handouts and then just, I think then we're ready for discussion about what's next. The first handout's very fleshed out. I feel like it's the one we know the most about. It's the one we've done the most work on this year uh, in many ways. Um, so it's the one that, that looks the best when you typed it up. When I typed it up, we typed it up. The second one is almost there. Uh, it's about the post-secondary high school completion. Obviously, it would be changed based on the committee's suggestions about what it's titled. We d I don't have the metrics, or we don't have the metrics about the return on investment there yet. It's something we are working on. We don't have all the same check boxes done for all of these yet, but you'll see that this is a pretty long list, and one question you might ask is, why is it so long? It's covering a period from fourth grade through college. So it's a pretty long pipeline we're talking about here. A lot of activities that are going on within the pipeline. But obviously there's some fleshing out that needs to be done. And then the final one, which needs probably a retitling, this is the one that's got the least flesh on its bones. It does have some activities now below that we've added. 
may or may not be the pleasure of the group to continue to keep those on the list, but it, when it was first typed up, it only had one thing on it, and that was really glaring. There wasn't one suggestion coming out of the group that had, or two, excuse me, that had to do with really finishing this out all the way through career. So this one probably needs the most work and maybe the most discussion, and obviously Duncan has already suggested a new title for it. The last thing I want to say before I'll just turn it over to, to some more processing on the group is in discussing this with one very interested observer who used to be staffed to this committee, one thing that comes up is do all three of these apply to every student or does the second one just apply to some kids who are going to college and does the third just apply to kids not going to college? That couldn't be farther from the fact. Every student, every family should see themselves in all three. Every student, whether they ever go to a post-secondary uh, system, if they ever get a credential, if they ever get a two-year, if they ever get anything, should be college ready. We shouldn't be deciding or sorting kids in high school about readiness for one thing or another. So everybody should be college and career ready. And similarly, everybody should be preparing for some kind of a career in Oregon. So it's not two different tracks, number two and three. They're both for everybody. I think if you put them all in one, personally, it's a lot all in one. It becomes too big a bucket. But I guess the worry is if you don't have them together, it makes it look like a track, and that's not what it's meant to say. So where we left at the last meeting, the last slide were these questions. And maybe we've added some today. And the question that we've added today is, are some of these more important than others? We did say the questions that are up here, should some of them be taken off the list? Should some be added on? What's going to happen to what's on here that's not recommended and what's missing? And the additional question would be the priority. And I guess Nancy, being a more skilled facilitator than me, I'm going to also just openly say I'm, I'm open to any way to do this. One way is to go through these questions. Another thing could be that we'd actually take some polling of the group about priorities. But I just, I'm just thinking as the end in mind, we're a week away from being in front of the whole board and I would like some input into what we're going to do that day. Is, is what we're going to do based off of sheets like these? Or are they going to be presented in some other way to engage the board into the discussion? Well, I actually think I want the opposite of what you probably think I wanted from my earlier question. <laughs> I don't feel like I have any ability from the information we have to prioritize 27 things. I mean, if you ask me to say, which one of these is first or which is 27th, I don't feel, that's a much, I need a lot more information to do that. So if the question is, should these 27 things be on the list in these three boxes, I'm pretty comfortable saying yes to that. If it's, you know, how do I rank one versus the other, I don't feel at all ready to answer that, and nor will I be no matter how much we talk to the next hour. Yeah, I kind of heard, the, I sensed the group was, saying that in our previous conversation. So I would recommend around that, you know, the idea that we go back, and it's, it's really zigzagging between <laughs> OEIB, the subcommittees, the governor and the governor's budget and their timelines. And I think if people can just say, conceptually right now we think these fit nicely, we think they could leverage each other, and then start talking about how do you present this to the rest of the group, because they don't have near the knowledge you do. So that's going to be a really important step for the rest of the group. I think what we need to do is kind of get clear about up until when the governor actually proposes his budget, what's all the opportunities? And if we could do a timeline for you about here's how we could, here's when we would know mm -hmm. the actual numbers, here's when we would know return on investment, here's where we might even know the budget figures here is when we figured out where do these go? Are these additional resources? Are these looking at doing something differently? And then we could keep we could present a timeline about when we can come back with these. That's what I would propose, I think. Mm -hmm. The best thing about this presentation next week is right after that meeting, I'm going to Jakarta. <laughs> That's the best part of it. 
I really am. Focus, Dick. I, I really am. I've been to Jakarta. That will not be the best part. <laughs> Let me show you their uh, their telephone system. There. Wow. Uh, anyway. <laughs> but, so. Uh, yeah. The other thought I have. I mean, again, we've we've given. I, I think this process actually we've given a lot of feedback, which again I, I think we're at a point where if we can summarize this today, I mean each one of these I think our hard, all, each one of these need more work, frankly. I mean almost every element of this, and I think we've given a lot of feedback, which I hope then staff can go and refine and improve. And frankly, we've got the time. I mean it's unusual to have such a robust policy agenda at this point that we can pull together. If but the key, honestly, won't be this committee after today, right. Right. it's going to be, and I'm very confident, the town of the staff team, but each one of these, for example, just pick one, third grade reading, I totally support the goal. We've given a lot of feedback on issues around the specific proposals, and again, if you can go, you know, think it through a little bit more, I think come back, we'll have a really, really solid plan on the third grade reading agenda, and that's, I think, I think we're in a really good spot, but it will work, but, and then, then we can do the prioritization, or whoever does the prioritization among the, if we have you Both the plans and the numbers. The, the, the presentation that's been brought up, you know, the headings and stuff. Did we want to think about that? Uh, I, I'm a little concerned that we're a little bit like an IPO next. You know, we want to present our our, our best thinking. Uh, I know we can't uh, necessarily do the priorities or what have you, but just just the just what our uh, thoughts are as far as. Uh, wordsmithing or mm. talking mm -hmm. to somebody else outside of this room we yeah. have talked to the other OEIB members. Uh, does that make sense too? Absolutely. To, uh, and I think this this one here, uh, 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 so Ron has, has a, a 3 o'clock appointment. He'll be back just about 15 minutes. Uh, so, you know, if we wanted to, uh, we, we really, I mean, which is encouraging because I think this is the, the early, the third grade reading thing is, is early learning uh, education piece is, is new to Oregon anyway. I mean, Dick Alexander was the guy, was the guy you know, and so, mm -hmm. so this has been that's encouraging. So we've, we've danced around that. Maybe we need to work on maybe uh, what Duncan has had his great input on, you know, seeing if this is what we want. I, yeah? I, 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 I think we struggle with several of these and ask for information in the last meeting. You don't feel like we've got a whole lot more information. The ELL funding formula doesn't make any sense to any educator that I've talked to. It's not, it doesn't wash out with what really is going on in our schools. Um, it doesn't address the real issues that we have with ELL, except you know, or for, as we sit here, we're going to move it forward. And I, I just don't get at what point are we going to um, get more information that really shows how this change in the formula makes sense for us, um, when this is far and far from what the educators are saying there is the true issues. The ELPA test has some issues. We have dual identified students. It's a real issue. And we can dig in into the weeds, which I don't think we're prepared to do as a committee, right. but we, we don't have any of those professionals here who are dealing with this every day, but yet we're going to um, make a change that will heavily impact our schools. And so, so Sarah, we, Sarah, could you, I know you're prepared to speak now, I think, a little bit about how it was developed and where it came from. So, Rob <coughs> couldn't be here today, but he did ask that I Sarah, state. why don't you come on up? Yes. Sorry, yeah. Thanks. Join the party. Join the party, <laughs> So, um, Thank you. you know, Sarah Pope, for the record, Chief of Staff, Oregon Department of Education. On the ELL proposal, we have, um, for over the last three legislative sessions, been debating um, how do we incentivize and see better outcomes for English language learners. And we brought this proposal to this group um, a little over three months ago now as our best thinking and working alongside researchers, staff, educators, um, policy thinkers across the country. And Rob's real firm belief on the ELL one is that if we're going to see better outcomes for students, this is where the rubber meets the road. We're going to have to ensure that we're incentivizing and providing resources and funds to make sure that our English language learners get better outcomes. And it's a real question of equity. And when are we going to when are we going to advance that work? This is so not what any educator, the, the president of the ELL teachers, who's been working diligently trying to improve student achievement, 
would say this is nowhere close to what we need to address. We need to address the issues that we have around our dual identified students. That's not in here. We need to look at the age of entry of students. This proposal actually could take away money from our elementary ELL students that they need in order to have the instruction they need. Um, there's, I don't know which educators you've been working with, but this is, I mean, the president of the ELL that took the TSOL conference that was here, I've talked with all those individuals about what does this look like, and I don't know where the research is coming from, but that is not what educators are saying. So do you have the names of the educators from Oregon that worked on this that we can communicate out with them and see where they're coming from? I'm not certain what you mean by the dual identified as being the issue. Did you want, I'm just going to look for Peter for a question. Is that special education and ELL? Is that what you're? Yes. So another, another issue is the over-identification of students of color um, in special education. But this is really focusing at when we look at what happens with the outcomes for English language learners when they exit prior to high school and where they are with high school graduation rates compared to English language learners who stay in programs well beyond seven years, we know that something has to shift. And what we're currently incentivizing with our current funding formula is the longer you stay in English as identified as an English language learner, the longer your school district receives additional funding. So the, the task force that's working on the formula looked at all of this, heard testimony, and is going nowhere close to recommending this moving forward. So I'm not sure why. That's not my understanding of the task force either. Okay. Well, I guess we can pull the notes from the task force. We could, and that might actually be an interesting point. I know some folks in this room were part of that task force. But my understanding of the task force is that there was a very, a very strong interest in looking at the four-year and seven-year marks, and also very strong interest in changing the weight from 0.5 to 0.6, and that there's a subgroup coming back together again to further examine some of the other elements and those those two elements in more detail. So, so in this, so my take on this one, I mean, in some ways, I'm in agreement with Hannah in this this sense that I th I think it's a big issue, and I think ELL, I don't think we're doing right by that student population. I think the formula is part of the issue. I don't. I think the formula does create the wrong incentives, whether how much it affects behavior, I don't know, but I don't think it's a good idea to have a formula that incents the behavior you don't want, and that's what we're doing now. And so I think it's well worth looking at the formula. It is also very complex, and I think you guys did a great job in putting a proposal together. I th again, the beauty right now is we have a little time. If we can get the folks you're talking about, get the right people in the room, to take another careful look at this, I think it will be ready for a significant change, which will be really good for Oregon. Uh, but And so I, I think the role of this committee is to say, yes, this is an area we need to focus on. Um, let's get the right people in the room. Let's take a look at what you've already done. Let's look at what the task, you know, all, everyone, all the different points of view. And under Nancy's leadership, let's get a you know, more refined proposal ready so that it's ready for the legislature. Um, I think that's that, a really... So, so I mean, I think that's where we are. I mean, I don't. Again, I've been talking with. I mean, I've been getting an earful from different points of view. I, I have some concerns, as you know, but the existing proposal, a little different from Hannah's, but I don't. I certainly don't know all the issues of. You know, there are a lot of different categories of English language learners. But the basis is we're not. We, we do agree upon. We're not. We don't like the outcomes today. And we need. To, and this is an opportunity we want to try to try to fix. And there may be more than just the formula change that we need to work on. I would be very. I would not be surprised if there were other items we put in. In, into this mix, but I think we've called out a really important issue, and we have the time, and we ought to make sure it's a priority of this budget and this policy agenda for the governor. And there's a couple questions within the proposed change. I think Duncan made a good point, and you know, feedback from the group would be helpful at this stage because we do have the flexibility of a little bit more time. But sort of first question is, do we change the funding formula? And if you change it, in what ways would you recommend changing it? Other questions would be, are there additional changes outside of the funding formula mm -hmm. that you yes. recommend making? Um, so feedback on those components would be helpful um, as we continue to refine right. it between right. now and the start of the legislative session. The overarching is making sure that we actually funded a, a level where students can have access to the programs and services that they need. We're simply not doing that but we're going to move the deck chairs around a little bit and we're going to provide 200, we're going to dangle a little money. And I'm going to tell you again, and I'll say it over and over again, if anyone believes that dangling a little money in front of something is going to make anyone work any harder, 
for the students that we serve, and they don't know the hearts of the educators in this state. It's not about the money. It's about giving them the support that they need to be successful with the students that they work with every day. So I still have seen yet have anyone show me any research from any state where we dangled the money in front and it's really helped students. There's nothing out there on pay, there's nothing out there that I've seen from any anyone here that shows that someone's dangled a little money and people work harder because they're gonna get a little money. So there's three components to the ELL proposal and it might be interesting for this group to kind of discuss each of them individually as a recommendation around what you might tweak. The first part is looking at the weight from 0.5 to 0.6. So not really kind of an incentive in the truest sense of the word. It's recognizing that English language learners need additional resources and that we're going to shift the funding weight from a 0.5 funding weight to a 0.6. That's element one. The second element is around the length of time. So currently in our funding formula, if your district identifies you as an English language learner, you can remain an English language learner indefinitely. This proposal would change that to four years and seven years, depending on where you've started with your English language development. The third and final component, which is a smaller component, but is a component, which it sounds like you were speaking to, is the $250 if the English language learner, even after exiting, um, graduates from high school. So those are the three components. It might be interesting for this group to say, you know, we like the direction of this. We'd recommend looking at this a little bit more because um, there is a component to it that you don't want to throw the whole thing out um, if there's pieces that you think are going to move the dial. And I think that's what we keep coming back to. When you look at our graduation rates for English language learners who stay in ELL beyond the seven years, they're in the low 50 percent. When you look at graduation rates for English language learners who exit prior to starting high school, they're in the mid 70s. And so what we're trying to get at is how do we fund a program that gets more outcomes like the latter than the former. Okay. So the direct question from the group, I don't know if that's something you could address. So it says three things there, that the formula, um, the length of time, and then the $250. And the first part is the weight, the 0.5. The, the weight in the formula, yeah. thank you. And the fourth component, actually, sorry, is the 90%. The 90%, yeah, that's a My problem. friend at OSBA. Yeah, I, I, have a, I, have I have a problem. I have a problem. So the fourth component of it is saying that if you receive, when you receive this extra funds, 90% uh, of it has to be spent on English language learners. So that's the fourth component. And that's the problem I have, because I think that's a, both inconsistent with our funding philosophy in general and an accounting nightmare. And I think what we really ought to be focusing on is the outcome, which is learning English. And whether, again, I, I could quibble with the details of the formula. I think we should keep looking at it, but I think it's the right direction. Um, with that, so I, don't, I don't think it makes sense to require districts to document their spending. And I used one example, dual immersion programs, where how would you do that? It just doesn't, it would be incredibly. Nancy, it sounds like cash or clunkers. But, 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 I, but, I, but I do think it's the right direction. Everybody forgot about that. I think that gives us some good direction to go back. And, you know, what I would really like to keep in front of us is that these are students who deserve to be graduates. And we need to use the research we All have and every possibility. And I think to keep doing what we've always done, to me, is an unethical issue right now. Yeah. We've done it for a very long huh. time, and it hasn't gotten the students uh, where they need to go. So, you know, I think we have to stay with it and try to find the thing we're all comfortable with. Um, I also want to remind us that OEIB, one of the policies we passed was an equity lens. It is a core belief about the work we need to do. So I just think, you know, so let's take it, let's take the good input, and let's try to um, keep seeing if we can figure something out that people feel really comfortable that we think will really make a difference for the students. Can you share that, the research and those who worked on this? Yeah. That information? Sure. Okay. Thank you. And if I could, one follow up, Hannah, we are researching different, it was sort of a short timeline, there's a lot on our small team's plate, is the work that other states are doing about changing formulas and incentives to try to ferret that out. It's difficult, because just like in Oregon, you have to go to individual districts to find impact. So we are, I would love to have that be a presentation. We're just not ready in the timeline that we had. Are there any states around us that are really doing a good job when it comes to this kind of research stuff? With ELL? Yeah. Um, California, around us. I mean, to be honest, I might need to defer to other folks that are in the room. I know California is one that I know about. But it's a different question. I'm trying to look at states that have done 
so incentives or oh, changes to funding. Okay. There are states where they have 19 or 20 different funding formulas, mm -hmm. depending on what handicapping condition you have. If you have in special ed, you get a 1.03 at a 1.13. If you're autism spectrum disorder, you get a one point. It's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, a lot of different points. Okay. Few have outcomes. So, so you, have, you have enough there to go back on then? A absolutely, and I, I think it would. I think it'd be very helpful and instructive to our group to to see if there's others to call out from the last meeting. For instance, I was aware of Duncan's uh, uh, comfort level around the ninety percent. That that's something we've gone back. We know we need to look back at. Uh, Hannah had had comments on the ninth grade on track. Duncan had comments about the third grade reading not being tight loose. And we could discuss those more, or maybe folks need to make sure that the thoughts that they're having about these are on the record, but we intend to be following up on all those. But I think it, it does beg a question is in front of the whole group, what would you say about ELL? I think it's just good to discuss. Are we in favor of it with all these caveats? Here's work that OEIB needs to do. Would we just go with a large group? You know, Dick, I don't know if that's going to be your job to present or mine, but I think it's that's a good why question. I'm going to Carter right after yeah. Uh, Is it, how are we going to represent the concerns that were just aired, well, uh, along with uh, Dr. Golden's clear focus on the need to do it? I'd be well, looking at the outcomes that we want, then go back to what Hannah's discussed today and everybody else, and how we're going to get to those outcomes. So maybe. I mean, we've got these three. I like this frame. We should just. You want? Is your proposal we walk through them? Is that and go yeah, and one I, by one and give more feedback? Is that what you're looking for? That would be great. I, I didn't know I, if we want to call out individuals. Maybe we could within the frame. Yeah. Okay. So is that okay with the remaining members of the committee? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, so let's start out with. Could I, could, oh, yeah. Could I talk a little bit about sort of a philosophical piece that I have heard come up again and again? You know, I was. Um, I've been on the OEIB from the beginning. I mean, I was the governor's alternate chair and his education advisor in 211. So when we came up with the concept of tight loose, we always talk about but what if it's loose in schools or districts aren't achieving, that we want to bring support. But at some point, you do need to get tight. I think you've heard me say tight, loose, tight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked about districts, we've also talked about schools, but I need to say when 68% of the kids are meeting a reading benchmark, meeting or exceeding, and we know how predictive that is of them graduating, when we have seen that data year after year in my mind, what we did in reading was not outrageously tight, but it was putting a bit of parameters, and I think um, we can't afford with something like that to just work with individual districts. The number is too low compared to what can happen for our students. So I, you know, I think that is mm -hmm. part of the, the philosophy. Right. And I don't think we should do that often, but I think there are some that have such an impact that we do need to do that. Okay. Why don't we uh, take a step, let's go about 10 minutes here. Okay, quick great. break. Sorry, three, uh, 320. So I think, uh, Peter, if, if we could, what we could do here is, is take our, our three, uh, are they, actually, are they? I'll call them up, but everybody's got a copy. So what do we, what do we call these? These are our, I think buckets is the buckets, wrong name. I know, uh, but I, like I think buckets, buckets okay. Yeah, You're buckets. the chair. Yeah, buckets. Whatever <laughs> it's outcomes. called. No, outcomes. Results. 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 Okay. And we're going to kind of go over those and see how we would... Yeah, as a tool the for the... OEIB. Correct. At, at, as a whole. Okay. So starting with pathway... Yeah, let's third. Do start with those if we could, instead of that we've... So question... Uh, Pam, are you on the phone by any chance? Pam Curtis? So no, the... It doesn't even have green on it. Yeah, it does now. Okay. I think, I think we're all set. So the, okay. the original question is... I think I think was answered by the committee, which was to keep third grade reading and ready for kindergarten together. Um, any thoughts about this handout? Uh, I guess the, the the format of all three of them is goal at the top, numerical goal, and the sub goal sort of near the top, and then that little matrix at the bottom showing the investments. Right. Let's jump. Let's jump to the pathway one. The, 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 okay. the second one that you did. So we good on the third grade reading kinder? 
how it looks, how it feels, how it's set up? I, I would just say that in this area, two things. One, let's really implement full day kindergarten, make sure that we put the funds in if we're prioritizing. And secondly, let's make sure we invest in some summer school so we avoid the slide, which I think is one of the key indicators. Yeah. So if we, were, yeah. if we were prioritizing, what do we do to move that? Um, those would be, depending on, again, how much money we're looking at out of the board we, system. Yeah, we also need, some way or other, on a full day kindergarten, how that reflects on the daycare situation as far as uh, the low income people of our state. Uh, seem like there might be a nice return on investment there on getting higher quality, high quality uh, care of their children, whether instead of in the uh, neighborhood, neighbor, or whatever else. So if that's, if that's an economic return, somebody has that. Can I just increase third grade reading for sure, right? Yeah, That's exactly. What looking for. exactly. Exactly. Can I just want to understand correctly what you said. So, does, are you, does that yeah, because the kids are now in school for the full day, those families, there's a, a return because they don't need to spend that on? Yeah, I wonder if that is for the lower. You know, we were looking at that in this poverty issue in our state. That just maybe that's just a. There's a, many of these. I think what sometimes what we do is some of our families um, need, you know, who are struggling, right. the state will place their children in daycare. Right, right. To, to provide that support. So if if, the, if they're in full day kindergarten, then that resource would need to be set in the other would need to be spent in, in the other program. Is that wrong? I need to. I would okay. be remiss in my duties as the director if I did not chime in here. That for some families that may be true, but remember school ends at three, right. and for work, and working families work odd shifts, and so having full day kindergarten. Um, helps remove the need for child care in the afternoon, but if you're working swing shift, yeah. which a lot of our families who receive subsidy do, it doesn't remove the need for the state to provide a subsidy for low-income working families who work odd hours. So right. just but keep that in just yeah. keep that in mind when you're right. talking and about And so after school, and that's right. time for that. That's but, right. But if there could be a difference just in that. There could, period we could time. realize maybe some cost savings yeah. for um, families who need care between noon and whatever they get home. And then the other truth is there could be more families who need the care than when we get it. So it's That's just, always true. Right. Yeah. So it's always just something to look right. at, but there's exactly. a lot of factors. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's, yeah. Great. Yeah. That's great. Other thoughts yeah. about that? Um, Outcome. The, the one just I, I mentioned this to Nancy, and I, I think I'm, now there's so many pots. I'm not sure I remember them all in terms of. But is there a good strategic grant pot for the third grade reading that you have a lot of flexibility to spend for the after school programs, like Hannah suggested, and other other programs outside the K-12 system itself? Do we have enough money there? Well, it just depends on what in the end is as we bring these proposals forward. But how much money we but, propose? But you got but you got that in mind at a pot because again, what we've learned on this, I think, flexible money in this area for things like helping pediatricians think about program. You know, this is a this is a system redesign where I think you're going to find yourself in the next two years making investments all along the early childhood continuum with reading. You know, sort of bringing the reading lens to, you know daycare, pediatricians. When, we, when I ran that, we ran a third grade reading initiative in Multnomah County a few years ago, and we learned the opportunities with the library, pediatricians, just the whole range of partners. Um, obviously, things like you know, all the, the reading programs, smart program, yeah. and I just think you need money that isn't just going out for competitive grants, but just that you can, as, as you are on this journey, you can use flexibly to make a difference, because ultimately, the schools matter, obviously, but it's the whole yeah. community, and we need to figure out how to bring the whole community I don't into this. We've thought about that yet, but we will. I mean, we've talked pretty specifically about, you know, um, between summer and after mm -hmm. school and stuff like that. I, one thing I'd like to say, just in support of low performing schools, because something that's not on this list, which I think is critically important, is le leadership training. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we have quality educators, and mm -hmm. where you, we, you know, we still put look at that pop, but, um, you know, I think when you see low-performing schools in district, mm -hmm. we know that in order to turn those schools around, leadership matters, yep. but it could be within that proposal there's some money to do that. I think that's yeah. the latest thinking. So even some of these other things, 
that's why we have to go deeper because uh, right now the thinking is leadership would come in that pot. Right. If it wasn't, I would be deeply concerned. Yeah. I know how well, I just to follow up this once more and then a little bit of this. But I mean, I just think, for example, like in economic development, the governor has a strategic reserve. Because frankly, you aren't going to know what you mm -hmm. need to spend money on in the next two years. And I think we should be advocates. Again, the legislature, I know they, if they give you a pot of money called strategic grants. They want to have it in very carefully siloed grant programs. I think you need very flexible money to not to, to be an agent for this whole initiative, because I think we, you can lead a third grade reading and get a lot of results, but it won't just be in the schools through the traditional funding formulas. Um, you're going to need some flexible money. Some of the, some of the work of the RACs, that mm -hmm. bringing everyone together, I think, has a lot of potential for providing those kind of services. Yeah, and they'll, they'll, really they'll, spot, and they'll spot examples and you can feed yeah. them, yeah. Okay, uh, Pat, Peter, Pat, one sorry, go ahead. I was talking to, um, at the break, so I just wanted to, um, Frank, where is Frank? Is, is he here? And, and, and uh, just about looking at the collaboration districts and the cell survey to see if the districts who have used this collaborative model that does make a difference on tell. Is You know, is there more of a sense of good climate there? I know when Frank and I had a conversation, you know, they, they're thinking there could be. They haven't done deep. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really important to look at, too, because I think we, what we've learned from TELL, and TELL is important to us. We want to learn from what teachers have to say about mm -hmm. the clients, about what they need to be effective. So that could be a really good next step. Mm -hmm. And I talk to them, and they're willing to see if they can look at that data. Good. Pathway to post-secondary. So one of the comments here was have this be a single title pathway to high school and post secondary, and post -secondary completion and then it, it breaks the title subtitle thing but I, I'm not married to that any other thoughts about that you like folks like that amendment that Duncan has suggested no, absolutely okay so the the big piece here that I, I want to call out is a, a, an alarmingly bad statistic, which is the number of high school students who graduate who don't go to college, especially low income. And, um, and that clearly is partly the affordability strategy. And we've got a, we've got a you know, Ben presented the plan on, on trying to make, using the Oregon Opportunity Grant to make college more affordable. But I also think we have a significant cultural problem that this doesn't yet address, yeah. um, which is lots of students just don't see that opportunity, don't see the, the possibilities. And frankly, our, the research we did at OEA, I mean, at the heck, shows that lots of high school students don't even know how to fill out their, their financial aid form. And so don't, and aren't even taking advantage of money from the federal government that's here right now. And so. The best example of that was that when H and R block did it. Was yeah. Speed. Yep. Yeah, dramatically right. increased. So I have a, and this was a proposal that I floated at the HEC, but it doesn't fit in the HEC jurisdiction. It does in the K-12, so I'm going to throw it out here because it's one of those cross, it's one of those that cut across the system, which I think could actually make a pretty big difference. It wouldn't take a lot of resource. Is if we had a payment for high school, to the high schools, it would go directly to the high school that would be paid when a, for every high school graduate, and I'm picking, I'll pick a number off the top of my head, $1,000, but somewhere of that, and the student has filled out the financial aid forms, so they've got the scholarship and they've enrolled. And so, okay, sure. So the, the basic proposal would be this high school gets a payment when you, for every graduate who's completed their financial aid and enrolled in college. And the idea here would be very, it's, it's I think very consistent with what we're trying to do here, which is we want people entering high school to understand that the default choice, that the way we're expecting students to go is that they're going to have the opportunity to go to college. And it doesn't mean everyone will, but we want to set the system up so that the expectation is that they'll have that opportunity. And we know that both the guidance and, frankly, the basics of getting your financial aid in order and getting enrolled is a huge barrier um, for a lot of the, especially low-income students, to go on. And again, I think by calling this out and putting some additional resources so the high schools can you know, figure out the best way to get the job done um, could really make a difference and be a big signal. And, and really, I think, in, this, in some ways, it's a critical bookend to our story. We have the ninth grade counts. We'd have high school completion. 
and, and, and college attendance. And then with the HEC, we will also have the Oregon Opportunity Grant and college completion as a payment. Um, I think we would really be sending the right signal that we want students to have the opportunity to go to college, and that that's the expectation. So I would add that to our potential list of opportunities. What if we funded counselors? Well, this could be used to... level Instead of giving them that dangling the money, but just actually say that we value... It's, you having yeah. the access, and well, that's what... You, you could do it that way. This, that, that schools may choose to, to hire counselors. That could be one way of use of it. But the other way is to fill the, find the partnerships. I mean, there are lots of ways to... to uh, but we need to find it. This, but the, again, to, we know H&R Block is a good example. There may be ways to fill out the fi financial aid you know, with community supports. There are lots of ways to... to it's, it's to try to, to make that bridge more effective. I guess I'm... I'm bothered by that. I mean, I, rewarding them for students to go on to college or something vocational, mm -hmm. I think is good. That's what we want to have done. Focusing on the, the, the financial aid, I mean, how, this will sound terrible, so Betsy can make a headline out of it. But how can you say someone's college ready if they can't figure out how to do a financial aid form? It's, well, they're not simple. They're not all the, I understand all the people at H&R Block are not people who are going off to university. But, it seems to me we have a failure of being college ready if you can't navigate the college application process. It's really a complicated form. It really is complicated to fill out. Go on. What we need, what we need is get the. And we need Pell counselor. Grant. We need the Pell, yeah. Pell right. Grant form here to go right. around. Which is again, that. everyone here fill one out here within thirty minutes. No way. I've been involved in that at McLaren, and it's. And that's why, and, and so again, I, I'm not, I, I, counselors are a strategy to do it, and that may be the right strategy. I just, I'd like to call, the, yeah. again, we are not getting, a, a key result is not getting accomplished right now. Well-educated students who, who could go on to college aren't going, and, and many are going without the Pell Grants, which are available. So um, it's just, it's an opportunity for Oregon, whether my proposal is the right one, but I think some way to call out that need is really an important um, missing piece of this, and again, I throw it out um, if you want us to analyze it, but something like that, I just think there's a missing um, component of, our, of the links that we have in this, this overall really great proposal um, that I think would, would, would make it more effective, and, and financial aid is a big piece of it. Do we know about other states that have done something more aggressive to help students with that part of the process? Yes, exactly, counselors. Yeah. You know, we've got some things going in, in schools, and it starts in elementary school where, you know, you have the college uh, pennants up on the wall, and where are you going right. to go? And you just it, aspire, I think. Mm -hmm. is, yep, that's a good so example. Th that's a great program that kind of gets everyone. The expectation is, hey, where, do you, where is it you're going to? Not if, it's where. Right. And that follows them through. Um, so that is a, an investment in something that... I think we have to share information on professional development around the state, how, how that work is working, because I believe what I've heard is where it's been implemented, it's been very successful. Yeah, they're, good. they're good models out there. Peter, do we, do we want to fill in these the checks there in the bottom, too? Or what? Yeah, I was unable to log into my computer uh, for a bunch of this weekend, so the, I'll, the next time you see this, the check boxes will all be done. It's my omission. Um, okay. So I do hear that that's something that we will be working on to FAFSA and discuss. That was it. part of what we had envisioned that could be available to students. For example, the Accelerated Learning Committee talked about that um, one of the courses that could be made available would be something like a college success course for yeah. students that aren't already kind of envisioning themselves on that path. And that's where you could fill out college applications, you could fill out your FAFSA form, actually fill out your individual profile and talk with people, get a sense of why would I want to go to college or why would I want to enter some other pieces. I mean, apprenticeship programs have yep. to be really, Absolutely. really exactly. for and I've, That's a terrific um, opportunity for them. So that is part of that at London advising to sit down and say, how do we create structures for students that start early and then maybe actually engage them directly in those activities that you've talked about? Because Aspire, we you know we could put a lot more money in Aspire, and they'd have to reach out to try to reach all those schools. We might be able to make it part of a class that students can actually take for credit. Mm -hmm. 
many of our um, comprehensive colleges yeah. and community colleges offer that course for college students. And there's no reason they can't start taking that early and take those first steps. Yeah. So it's on our radar. We need to maybe center it a little bit higher. Okay, any other comments about the pathway to post second high school com and post-secondary completion bucket? Yeah. In looking at this one, um, I, I think the ninth grade on track is getting a little clearer um, understanding about how that, how our rural districts are doing, because that's been something that, how we make sure we assist them in the way that they need the assistance. I'm not sure that I understand what they really want and what would be really move the dial for us. Um, there are the mentoring. Um, I think there were quite a few questions about the mentoring program, mm -hmm. and I, I believe we have a plan that's worked, but I think to have more information for the board to see what's been implemented, some facts on where it's working and how it's working would be helpful if that's... Uh, the priority for us. So those would be the two that I would say. Okay. Other thoughts from the committee? Okay, and the final one with the, first off, the title, uh, Duncan had proposed one in the beginning. Do you want I think to it connecting, float it connecting education and training to careers. One suggestion. Any other? That's one suggestion or thoughts. You want to use the drop, you want to put the pathway in front of that? Keep the, just keep the three the same with the first words pathway, or does that make any difference? Doesn't make any difference. Huh? Pathway connecting education to careers or something? You just look at them and say, yeah, I, I'd use, I don't know, I'd, I'd tie the three, three. That's nickel dime, but yeah. I mean, I, to me, I, I think what this is about, and again, this is this is the, the title matters in the sense of what we're trying. It, to me, it's we, we've got the goal, we've got the education attainment goals, you know, to try to improve mm -hmm. the path, the pipeline, high school graduation, college completion. Now we're talking more a nuanced conversation. Of are, are the degrees we're delivering ones that are connecting with careers, and and it also extends that conversation into the adult population. And so, this is this to me is a. We need to be looking at strategies that are more nuanced, if you will, yep. to meet the needs of employers. And this, I know Hannah's got the question: What are the employers' needs, and, and you know, how do we find the jobs that really pay well and, and so help? Say people. that back to us, Peter. That, 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 that. Uh, pathway connecting education to careers. It's good. You okay, everybody. Sound okay. I did struggle a little bit with metrics, and maybe there's workforce expertise in the room who knows more than I do around state existing metrics, like 40, 40, 20. Do we have a metric or a call out regarding how many percentage of student by what date should be you know, connecting to a career of choice or anything like that? Or I know we've got some STEM calls. Yeah, we've outs. got the STEMs. I mean, we've got engineering. I mean, the STEM goal, 2x the number of STEM degrees. Do we have any more credentials? More comprehensive goals? Um, and I'll continue to work on that with. Well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, we can propose. Yeah, there, there's. Yeah, we, we can propose several. I don't want to Dr. Cannon. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we, we have been, again, sort of in conjunction with this project that I described earlier for Hannah, where we would attempt to take stock of, of our employment forecasts and match up our certificate and degree goals to those with a real focus on the adult population. We have been, um, again, a, attempting to at least do the background work that could create um, goals for the adult population specifically, understanding as the OEIB um, uh, sort of established earlier this year that our short to medium term goals for the for the adult population are probably not 40 40 20 right they ought to be more clearly linked to actual um, employer um, demand and workforce opportunities and that's the project that we're engaged with uh, the Department of Employment on, on now okay thank you on, on that like in the business community working with the business community since we're all in this together about mm -hmm. building those jobs mm -hmm. and having mm -hmm. high wage, mm -hmm. living wage jobs that are available. 
is that where, where are the meetings with the business community going with this? Where well, we just started? well, they all we've just been all over the state, and um, we're working with for our work we're doing. We've been regional meetings, listing the um, business. Well, they actually made two tours around the state on this recently, but for the business plan and business organ. And again, we've got a lot of information about where the shortage is. And as, as we've talked, as someone mentioned, apprenticeship, skilled trades, <coughs> manufacturing, as well as the high-tech engineering across the board we're hearing in every corner of the state. Then we're also working with four industry clusters, healthcare, um, high-tech, manufacturing is a broad category, and then just the trades again. To, and again, all four have identified significant areas of need. And so the idea would be, um, I mean, the, the challenge on all this is to figure out what's, what's, why, why do we have such a problem? There are really two pieces. One is these, these courses are expensive. Just, you know, career technical courses cost more than general courses, and we don't have any formula adjustments to reflect the higher cost. And then I think the second issue really is the employment picture shifts all the time, and it's really important for the schools to find ways to get more connected with employers in a more seamless way. And so I think one of the challenges with all this work is how do we find a way to pay for the programs that are actually leading to jobs? And that's a really tricky piece of work. And I think it does involve, frankly, the employers putting some skin in the game to say it's, it, you know, that there should be additional payment to the schools when the, you know, they, they get an employee that is you know, ready to work. And, you know, we could think about a lot of ways to do that, but we need to really explore. I mean, the hospitals, for example, do that right now. I mean, they put, you know, it, but so I think it, to, to crack this, we've got a combination of we need to put more for a lot of these programs because they cost more, whether it's engineering or a whole variety of them. And we need to make sure there's a strong connection so that the schools understand that, you know, they, they, you have to constantly be reevaluating your programs you know, because the economy changes so fast and the work changes so fast. And so, um, Figuring out ways to more clearly connect the schools with employers is, is also part of the challenge here. So um, Ben's doing a terrific job. Um, Agnes and Danny, and I, mean, I think this this needs more work. This proposal, but um, I think through a combination of formula changes and different weights, I think we can really make a difference um, on the ability to deliver for industry through both high school and, and community college and higher ed. I don't know if that answers yeah. you. <clears throat> Here, what was the, the collective impact of the communities coming together? You know, that's, a, that's very similar to what Duncan's saying right now, that the communities come together. Well, and I, I, it is listed under here as a STEM, STEM hub sort of operating part of their framework for for that. I don't know that there's a proposal. I, I, I was writing down everything that Duncan said because that starts to sound like collective impact multiple folks working mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's yep, it got a name or it's just a it's bubbling There are a lot there. of people working in it and a whole bunch of I mean we're trying to pull a lot of folks together I mean and again the governor I mean Agnes and Danny have been terrific on this so Should it be and, on the and, list somewhere to indicate that that work is happening do mm -hmm. you think? Well I think we should try to come back to you with a more specific proposal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. so but I think ultimately I, I looked at Ben here I mean it's it, the formula changes for the community college and higher ed, and both for ETIC and uh, well, in general, are really important in this regard. Because I can't stress, we have we do not wait in the community college for CTE. That's just it, it, those programs cost more, and if you don't give additional weight, you you it, it makes it much harder to deliver them because they're not. And uh, so that that's one of the issues, and the, and the community college folks are looking at that. Elizabeth, and um, but it will, and it, frankly, will take more money. Um, at some point to, to deliver it. Bouncing back and forth here. Um, yeah, I can only underscore what Duncan said. If, if the interest of this committee is in a recommendation for workforce-related, significantly boosting the number of workforce-related certificates that our community colleges in particular and potentially other uh, providers of training create, then the formula changes and increased funding that we kind of wrapped into, together we wrapped into the higher education productivity agenda because we're talking about other uh, formula changes to incent other things too, not just CTE, you know, career-related certificate right. production, but that is, that's the way you'll get there. You have to, you have to weight those, um, those certificates uh, in a conjunction with their cost and their value, 
<laughs> and then you have to put more dollars in the pot. And, and if we do those two things, um, our community colleges in particular will respond by ramping up uh, programs, many of which are in existence already, but are insufficiently funded to produce the needs, the demand, the, to meet the demand of their um, local, regional, and state communities. What, what do we, what's the percentage that we currently fund for higher ed? Percentage of, percentage of the oh of the total I couldn't tell you off the for community colleges state funding represents approximately half of the total funding um, and for four year universities public universities it's a lot less it's going to be in the fifteen to twenty percent range so how far away is the business community from helping to increase that funding level so we can actually provide the support to the yeah, students it's interesting to say that I said my tech to Shoreline in Seattle because there's three manufacturing companies who have invested in Shoreline and for the Northwest, about six states, all the techs go into three manufacturers, Hyundai Chrysler and uh, AAA. So, I mean, I mean our, whole, our whole strategy is to give money to higher ed. That's what we believe needs to happen. But we also, I, that's through the revenue system, but I also think, as I say, we may need to put more employer, find ways to create more opportunities to directly invest. But, but that said, that won't take care of the problem unless you deal with the formula change. But the other thing I would just stress is some states put more money for high schools. Just for, again, the same issue that applies to CTE in high school, yep. that we don't have a weight. Yeah. And so, I, again, I think it would be worth thinking about as we do this work, and I, I think that is in the conversation, to, to have an additional weight for CTE in high school. Um, but Because these are, these are expensive programs. Yeah. And... Uh, um, and yeah, we, we, in a second, they are expensive programs, but are they expensive? Because that person's going to get a job. Like that. Well, they, I think they're high-value the programs. They're, they're they high cost, they cost more, but, they, exactly. but the value is exactly. high. And frankly, a two-year CTE program is less than a four-year degree. Yeah. I mean, it's a two-year program. So even if it costs more per year, it doesn't necessarily cost more per graduate. In fact, it doesn't. But, and so I, I would argue it's actually a bargain. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, so it's been a while since I looked at the research, but it was, you, know, you said affordability, and we're, we're working on that. But if you ask students why, is that percentage still, is that the number one reason why kids aren't going is because they can't afford to go to community college or higher ed? Or you know, I'm, I'm more familiar with um, relatively recent work that was done here on why students who attend don't succeed, right? What, what, what accounts for the fact that it's roughly 60% only 60% of students who um, start out to get a four-year degree complete it at Oregon Public University. That's our six-year grad rate, essentially. Um, and affordability does come up at top of the list there, right? There are issues related to life and costs that, that get in the way. In terms of barriers for um, enrollment in the first place, I think it's probably more complex. I think that the affordability, I think it's complex in both cases, but affordability is, I, I presume a big part of it. So are some of the other, I, mean, I was very interested in the conversation about FAFSAs and kind of call it culture mm -hmm. um, well, and um, guidance and support at the high school um, level, um, family sort of participation. Uh, so it's, I, there are a whole host of, of barriers um, in terms of that, that issue. There's some time. So if you talk to parents about First generation college doors, where there's a, a barrier for some students because that's no, what we need you to do is we need you to start working right now to help your family. There's some of that, and I don't know what what percentage that is in Oregon. I know we have a really high poverty rate, um, and so how do we how do we get out there and maybe it's through the racks, Nancy, to have some of those conversations about engaging parents and how important it is, and is there something Aspire-like for parents to help them as mm -hmm. their children get into our public schools to help them see that that vision of building a better future? I think those are all things that, if, the more we can include students and parents in this conversation, the better. Totally. I think the more students that get those three college credits, the nine college credits in high school, that's one more step to making that, you know, two more years, maybe just a year and a half more. Any other thoughts on the uh, pathway connecting education to careers? A lot of great discussion there, things to understand that's going on even if it doesn't make the list. 
So we would be going forward to the board with these three documents as described, edited, probably a cover page that would uh, summarize the work that's gone on with this committee since September, just, uh, just showing it, the work that's gone on. Um, we can discuss the presentation. Is there anything else that well, folks... What between one sentence and a few yeah. paragraphs and a few pages, yeah. what, what are we giving them on each of these things? That's a good question. The, the entire board has received the uh, few sentences one. I believe the entire board has had the whole packet yeah. the last time we all met and did those little groupings. Uh, all of the board have talked in depth about one of the buckets. There were different buckets, but they weren't that different. I think it would be useful to at least take this amount yeah. and repackage it so that it's in the three packages. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay. And what would be, I think, helpful as well is to, if we're really going to discuss this, is to have people bring their packets back and have it say on this document that um, you just referenced which proposal it actually is in here in case they want to look back. Like the page number. Yeah, what page number yep. is it on in here um, so that they can relate a little bit to the full topic. Perfect. And, and not use a different name in every single document yes. for the same proposals. One I definitely. And you, you, it'd be great if you could at least by Monday get it out the, the, the sheet that you prepare from this meeting, get it up to so that you can make some comments on it. If they want Absolutely. To but that's it's, you know short. You got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I, yeah. Can I my feedback? I don't know if others feel about this, but to me, I, 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 I would propose a somewhat different format. The title. And then something about why is this important? Why is meet, meeting this goal important? And then how we measure, how, where are we today? And how, something about measurement, which you've got here. Yeah. I don't think these five categories here really add a lot, mm -hmm. honestly. I would, um, I, I think just putting the proposals on, I mean, maybe you, if some of you, if you want the checklist, but I think they, they kind of are dominant in the page. So mm -hmm. just why is it important? And then ideally, if you, in those small, short write-ups, if you could say, why does this support the strategy? Because you're really presenting a strategy here to achieve this right. goal. And so each one of these, when you have a short write, what's it doing to, to drive the result that you're trying to get? Then I think you've got a pretty compelling story. Does the grid work for folks showing the yep. different categories? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And then I could the definition could be somewhere else. Somewhere it could else, be yeah. the last page yeah, of that yeah. matrix or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And we have two actually three audiences. We have the OEIB boards as an audience. We have the legislature as an audience by those forward and the general public as an yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah. So we want So is anything in this presentation going to include numbers of any kind? Metrics. Well, That's not the numbers you're talking yeah. about. And I'll defer to Nancy. There's a question on the floor I can't answer. I just said, is anything in this presentation going to have any kind of numbers of any kind? Budget. Mm -hmm. Financial numbers? Yeah, dollars. Um, I, we would have the student numbers. We're not using the financial numbers. Is it possible to group them into things that are like things that cost more than a hundred million dollars and things that cost more than a million and less than a hundred million? Or, I mean, because some are no need, cost. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to refine it. A thing that costs a hundred million dollars sitting next to something that costs a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, we ought to at least be able to distinguish how many zeros are on the item, can't we? Or at least something. That, Order of magnitude. I kind of, uh, you know, I can check back about that. I, I don't know. Again, uh, so much of it depends on are you talking new money? Are you talking about? Well, but just money. If it costs a million dollars, presumably we can figure out how to find that. If it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, it does have to either have old money or something. I just think. We're back to the question of if somebody wants to say we can do it all, everything, all 27 of them, we can do it all, then I'm fine. But if, if we're really giving advice to the legislature and the governor and everybody else that's involved in the process and things are 
you know, there are multiple things on here that cost more than $100 million. You know, I just don't think we're ready for that because we talked about, first of all, these proposals need to be improved. We've talked about looking at, is this existing money, is this new money? And I think we can provide a timeline that would tell, maybe if we could just have a timeline that would tell when would we get to that point. Um, to allow all of you to see it soon enough to really be able to weigh in on it. Okay, well, I don't know if I'm going to give up or not. Okay. It, it still seems there ought to be some way to say this one's expensive, that one isn't. Pick whatever number you want. If 100 is the wrong number, pick some other number. But there ought to be some way to say the ones over here are, they involve a lot of money, they're important investment decisions. And these other ones are easy. They don't involve much money. They just involve changing the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Let me see what we can do. Okay. Okay. We just need to look at it. But I'll, I'll give you a serious thought and see if we're ready to do that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. We really, I mean, if, if what we're doing is we're supporting these three documents on, as a committee, if you're going to ask us to say we support all of these things moving forward, then there's no way that I can do that because I don't know what, how that, what that looks like, what's coming off the plate. So something's coming off the plate. And I don't know where that is. If it's if we're going to raise class size, because we right now we kind of leveled up, seeing a little dip, and now we're going to say, but this is more important than that. I just. I'm not sure what we're doing here other than saying there are a whole lot of things that we could do that would really help students in Oregon. And here's a list of 27 of them. But if well, you're I saying they really give us the list so we can go deeper and do some right. of this deeper work, we really could do that on the whole big right. list. It right. would be very labor intensive. So so we're not we're not saying to you that this is this is a list we should forward all of these to the legislature and say, or to the governor and say, Governor, all of these should be priorities. I don't think we're at that point yet. I think what you're saying, well, you've heard us say we have to go deeper on these proposals, so we're not even willing or ready to do that. So I think we're at a point that it's sort of a leaning towards these are the ones that seem to pack it well together in a way of leveraging. We'd like you to look deeper, and then we could also give a timeline about when would we be able to put money numbers to it and to also determine if, if right now can we at least say expend you know a, a range of about what the cost would be so what is the full board being asked to do next week well it's the first first reading of the recommendations and the and i assume we're going to uh, ask the board to give feedback, questions, thoughts, similar to what you folks have done, but in a more compressed time, which would prepare us for October actually approving the recommendations. So that's where I don't understand how we can keep saying it's really early in the process. It seems to me it's really late in the process. There's nothing, in there's, there's nothing here that allows for changing this much between next week and when it's final. I mean, we're, we're, you know, I mean, this is the finance proposal, basically. We're asking the OEIB to hear this next week, and then a month later vote that they approve it, and it's final. And so it's not early in the process. It's the end of the process for OEIB. It may be early in the process for the governor and legislature and such. But in terms of OEIB saying, this is, our, this is what we recommend. This is it. We're pretty much at the end of that. And so to keep saying these are questions we're going to answer later, we're not going to answer them for OEIB later, May answer them for the governor later, but not for us. That's my well, frustration. I think, I think one question that needs to be asked is does it need to be improved in October? Because if it doesn't need to be, it could be improved a little bit later. That could give us two months to really get all that information. So that's a core question that needs to be answered. Because I hear you saying you need more information before you're comfortable really approving the sentence. I think it's the question that gives you. If what we're being asked is, are these 27 things good ideas? Yep, I'm willing today to say they're all good ideas. I like all of them. If somebody can wave the wand and make these 27 things happen, I'm happy. But if you're asking me to prioritize them in some way that says these are more important than, you know, one's more important than the other, or, you know, or you know, I just don't have no ability to do that. Yes, I would 
throw out. I mean, I think I think you can get there. I mean, I think it's, I would say I think it's really important that this group has called out these three goals and laid, listed a set of strategies. And I think for OAIB to say, yeah, this is this is what we're asking Nancy to get done. <laughs> I want to say for the next two years, if we could do these three things, that would be enormous. And to say these are really pretty solid strategies for getting there. We don't know how much they cost yet. I'm actually more optimistic that we can fund a lot of this because I think I understand but the that's budget. That's the answer. I mean, if we're being asked kind of like a strategic plan or something yeah. to say, these are the strategies that we think are important. Right. I assume we can get a unanimous vote yeah. on that. It's it's when you turn it into that they are budget recommendations. Right. And then and these that, are budget yeah, recommendations. Yeah. And, and, and so then I would say that someone's going to have to put numbers to these at some point, yeah. <laughs> and that they, those are going to need to come back. I, somebody's going to have to decide that. I assume it's so that's it's, a strategic goals. Yep, I'm in favor. Uh-huh. Budget recommendations. And, and advocates but, for the specifics. But, but I think what we should shouldn't forget that this is an extraordinarily different budget than you've ever seen before. That starts not with the budget numbers, but starts with the goals and the strategies, and then you put the numbers to the goals and the strategies. Usually, it's exactly well. You seldom get to goals or strategy in most of the budget processes. So, I, I think, in fairness, that's a very big deal. Um, and that, but I, I hear what you're saying totally. We have you have to then put numbers to this, but. But again, to have a budget that starts with the outcome in mind and the strategies and the policies along with the budget numbers is a very different budget and I think going to be very helpful to Oregon. Can I just see? Yes. I see it differently. I think the outcomes are the common standards that we have. That's what we're supposed to be working towards. We do strategies and third grade reading as a benchmark on mm-hmm. But the ultimate outcome is the educators are focused on and we we're going to change that bogey, we better tell them quick, but those are what they have to work on. So as the OEIB, I'm hoping that we are going to provide them the support that they need to actually get there. And whether these strategies are the ones that are going to get them there, um, and I, I couldn't say I believe all these are the best strategies. I just don't, I don't believe that. Um, but. We didn't start with some of the important information, and I appreciate, Nancy, that we're going to really look at the TELS data and see what it look, see what we need. We're reaching out to parents. We're talking about her and technical. Parents have been talking about for quite some time in very different ways. Um, but if we're, if we're really going to do a budget differently, then um, I think using some of the information that we have from the educators and the parents would be a, a way to start. Okay, Peter. Anything else? Any public comment. Okay, I think let's we, do that. We have a lot to work on. Okay. Public testimony sign-in. I have a sheet in front of me. Uh, members of the public to give public testimony sign-in. There'll be one speaker for each group, and each person will have three minutes. My bad cops are sitting over there for the time. And Patricia Mueller, are you on the phone? Patricia? I guess she might be coming on later. Let's go with uh, Jim Anderson. Jim, the guy with the good handwriting. Yeah. I uh, really like to hear all the things you're saying. I I think there's a priority, though, of, of time. And that is, the first priority I see is what... Uh, Ms. Vandering was talking about uh, what kind of help and extra support can we give the kindergarten teacher? Because we right now have two pipelines, a pipeline of success and a pipeline of failure, and the minorities are primarily in the pipeline of failure. You've got to get them into the success pipeline right away. I, I think preparing poverty families to uh, act like middle class families it is a long term thing that uh, we should be working on but it, it's not the crisis thing we have these kids who are coming into into school they're registering in the school system and they need to be put on a salvation route we can't put them in a garbage route we've got to get them in the success pipeline right away because We'll never get them out of the failure pipeline if we don't do it right when they get into school. The other thing I see is is really critical is when kids come out of 
out of school and go into industry. We need to get these kids, it's a crisis next year, to get these kids into industry so that 80% of the jobs are not filled by outsiders outside the state. We've got to get these kids ready for the jobs that are available. And that's another crisis point. So I think, and another one, of course, is the ELL program where uh, Ms. Vandering was talking about how the, all the people working in that say they need extra support. And that's true of all the kids who need extra help, is they, we need to put in extra support in those key positions. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Dr. DePaul? You're up to bat. This is what I'm dealing with in my Saturday school. Are you passing it on? I have let the people see that. Uh, that's what I'm dealing with. These kids are coming to us from my school system. Most of the kids are not from Somali or from somewhere, somewhere. They are American born. They were born here. That's math. Six, seven graders. <coughs> That's how they function, Dick. Mm. Because you talk about prosperous Oregon. <coughs> how we going to do it? Then I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm trying to listen where those kids fit into the discussion. The teachers in the class. <coughs> They start from K-8, eighth graders, functioning like that. So I'm trying to see where they fit in, into the talks. Uh, I'm listening very, very carefully to see where we're going. We've got to do something. You hear me every time I make my presentation. We can't let this go on. You will be doing, I just find out Dick is working with men in prison. I do the same thing. We continue like that, that's where they're gonna end up. We have too many of them in there. Especially the dark skin ones. I buried so many of them in my community, where I was I would have, over there. Buried them in the ground, they died, they were killing each other. A prosperous Oregon. So, we've got to get some going. We've got to do something. I raised four boys uh, in this state. Two of them must go to Stanford. They went to Stanford, Santa Clara, OSU, and then the last one he decided to go into the Saints to play football. He played football. I don't really good teachers, and I don't know how difficult it is because it's a very civilized profession for me. I like it, a teacher. But are we looking at those kids in the classroom though? And I'm not knocking it, I don't know. How did those kids get in there? From K all the way to eighth grade, functioning like that. Did you, uh, are you passing it around to see how these kids are functioning? So we, we, we have some work to do, don't we? Yeah. Are we gonna do it, Dick? <laughs> I guess so, sir. Eh? We're trying. I'm a little disappointed your kids didn't go to Linfield. <laughs> And I can't sleep though. I, I'm not going to sleep. If I don't see something done with those kids, they were born here. They've been in this nation for 400 years. We love them up so much, we kill them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay Dr. Uh, Hartz. Dr. Tom Hartz, I have over 34 years experience in R&D and medical diagnostics and devices with technical startup companies and corporations such as Bayer, DuPont, Johnson & Johnson, and Welch Allen. 
I currently serve in the executive committee of the Business Education Compact, where I've learned a great deal from our educator, education board members, teachers, and students about proficiency-based teaching and learning. I'm convinced that this is the direction that your education needs to go, and strongly encourage you to invest in spreading the use of proficiency-based teaching and learning to position Oregon students for career-long success. PBTL teaches students how to learn and empowers them for lifelong learning. This is increasingly important. Students who rely on just what they are taught in their K-20 to years will become educationally obsolete at an increasing rate, particularly in STEM-dependent industries. New technologies and tools that are needed to feed a global population of 9 billion people, supply fresh water where it's needed, reduce environmental contamination, and provide better, better medical care are all under development. Graduates are needed who can continue to drive technological evolution and apply it to solving global problems. For Oregon to attract and retain businesses, we have to demonstrate competitiveness of our workforce in comparison to other states and regions. We need to attract students who know how to learn to our colleges and universities, then train them and retain them in Oregon companies. Silicon Valley, Research Triangle Park, the Boston area inside the Beltway, are examples of synergy between communities providing quality educational opportunities and high-tech companies depending on a capable workforce. This isn't just a role for institutions of higher education. It begins in the elementary years. Let's invest in creating high-quality teachers in every classroom. Let's help more of our K-12 teachers learn proficiency-based teaching strategies so that all of our children have the opportunity to become proficient in the standards and successful in school and competitive throughout their careers. Let students feel the satisfaction and confidence of knowing that they can evolve along with the amazing tools and technologies that we can't even imagine today. I know that there are a lot of programs, initiatives, and organizations all asking for money, oftentimes to fix the end results of students who have failed and have been moved along in our time-based school system without help. Oregon and the United States cannot be successful when students can receive a high school diploma with a grade average of D or D minus or require significant remedial training before being college ready. Investing upfront in our teachers' knowledge and skills of best practices and proficiency-based teaching and learning will be the best, the best investment you could possibly make. Thank you. Okay, uh, Frank. Thank you. Just wanted to echo uh, Dr. Golden's comments here on the collaboration districts and on the work that we've been doing. In addition to the, the positive outcomes for students produced by class districts and the collaboration grant, we've also seen positive shifts in uh, teacher attitudes in class districts, specifically around the areas of teachers feeling having a voice in district uh, leadership, as well as the belief by teachers that participation in, in class has and can improve student learning outcomes in their schools. Um, in my particular district in Albany, through the class process, it gave us, class gave us the time and the structure to come up with locally designed solutions around rethinking in those four key areas of professional development, evaluation, which is really supported by feedback um, to teachers, leadership for teachers, and alternative compensation models. So we, have, we are in the process of looking at some of the tell data, and um, we are working through our analysis of it. So I hope to have something um, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, are you on the phone there? Patricia Mueller? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Ah, uh, yes, we can. Uh, identify yourself, please, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for letting me call in. Uh, my name is Patricia Mueller, and I am an ES, um, ELL teacher at the Canadian School District. Um, I set some written testimony earlier, which I hope that the board has in their packet. And I had um, some concerns about the ELL funding formula mainly. And um, I would like to know that um, how my concerns are going to be um, addressed 
and the answers that I have, um, or the questions that I have answered. And I would like to know where um, will be the opportunity for ELL teachers to give uh, input to this before it goes to the legislature. Um, I just had a wonderful first day with students, and um, I'm still in my work room working, so I couldn't be there with you. Um, I had um, a, a celebration um, where I, my students, uh, my fourth grade ELL students, last year 100% of them passed the math folks test. So I'm not a person that's, you know, whining because, you know, um, I might think I have to work too hard or anything. I'm very concerned about the services available to my students and asking the people that teach those students um, what, uh, which of these ideas would work on the ground. A lot of times we have a problem bridging theory to practice and uh, we have a lot of unforeseen consequences that could result from this um, implementing the formula funding, the formula funding uh, change the way it is, especially um, when a student at the high school and secondary are not generating income any longer. And these are the students that need uh, the most intensive um, help. And so if you start the funding formula, and then where is the transition, and where is the money to help the, the really struggling students? Instead of just blaming us for those students that um, are not um, achieving, I'd like to see resources um, brought in so we can uh, do interventions with the students that haven't had a chance to, been, to go through an effective system and see if we can be successful getting those students um, up and then phase in a different funding formula and then make sure we're not leaving behind um, those that have already gone through the system in the, in the former funding. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm also would like to know, like we talked about, oh, we can do better. And I have asked many times, where are the people that are consistently doing better? Um, every once in a while, district head pops above the water and then, oh, we're doing great, but now we need to focus on this. And then the head sinks below the surface again. So how can we um, make it so we can be successful in everything we need to be successful in um, and not at the sacrifice of, of money for other programs that are also needed and also important? I don't want to pit programs against each other saying that, you know, to get 0.6 for ELL students that you know, we have to increase the class size um, in the elementary classroom because, you know, the 0.6 is funded out of the general fund. Um, that, that also negatively affects ELL students. So I'd like to make myself available to consult with whoever it is that developed these things uh, because I'm having a problem finding out who they are um, so I can get my input. And thank you very much for letting me talk to so long. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments of the comments of the committee? If not, we're adjourned.